Hi, folks. Pastor Mike Spalding here with my good friend and big brother. I am Pastor Casper, and we're here together to encourage you to keep listening to Deception Detection Radio, because we're both on this network with our individual shows. Yes, and yes. And we're going to be doing some things together as well, and I'll just say no more. Hey, folks, tune in Deception Detection Radio, some of the best programming in Christian talk, news, encouragement, and Bible studies. God bless you. God bless In the sky, gazing far into the night, I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through, it's true, baby let the light shine through, if you believe it's true, baby won't you let the light shine through, for you. Detection Radio. I'm Kay. And I'm Chad. We pray you all had a blessed week. Tonight we are excited to welcome back returning guest, documentarian, researcher, and up and coming author, our friend and brother in Christ, Ali Siadatan. Well, welcome back, Ali. It's so great to have you back with us. How are you? Fine. Thank you, Kay. Uh, thank you, Chad, for having me. I'm very glad to be back with you guys on Deception Detection, and I'm really excited about tonight's show. We're excited, too. Um, yeah, it's always talk- it's always an honor to have you on. Yes. it's uh, You've been coming on with us for quite a while now, and it's just we just love having you. Uh, yeah, I think it's been a couple of years. It hasn't been two years. Like the time does fly. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been. I was looking. I think we hit our friendship anniversary on Facebook recently, and that was for two years. Yes. Wow. Uh, it's incredible. The. Uh, um, no, it's, it's always it's always nice to be on on the show with you guys, and I, I appreciate the. The fact that you have this ministry and and uh, you've created this uh, place where we can come and share with with listeners, you know what the Lord pours into our hearts and minds. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start with the opening prayer. So I'll go ahead and lead us in. And uh, dear Father, we come before you tonight. We come humble and uh, we uh, want to praise your name and we want this to be the most edifying an informative episode to date, and we hope that uh, people's ears will perk up and that they will be etched upon their hearts, your words, and all glory to you. And uh, we just pray that everybody finds this edifying and informative. In Jesus' holy and mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Chad. No problem. Well, Ali, you have... Uh, told us that you have something uh, that you would like to share with us and our listeners tonight. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to you. And if you'd like to let people know, I, well, they should know about you if they've been listening. Um, you've been coming on regularly. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, okay. Thank you, Kay. Yes. My name is Ali Siaratan and my website is thinkagainproductions.com. And uh, the first documentary I made was called UFOs, Angels, and Gods, um, where, you know, we brought, and this was released in 2006, and we really brought some, what was for then, some great uh, groundbreaking ideas into the forefront, such as the um, relationship between the sons of God and the nations of the earth, uh, that behind the veil of the gods was the fallen angels, um, that they had given the laws of civilization as well as seeded the earth with their seed. Uh, and uh, they were preparing a UFO deception, uh, and then we exposed the alien abduction phenomenon by really, you know, talking in detail with with the, with the world's greatest scholar and bringing that information and showing how this related to uh, as the days of Noah and the reemergence of the Nephilim. And then we 
really close with the idea of the coming lie, which is it, it may be that the second coming may be presented as an alien invasion, which then solves the puzzle of why, why would the world go to war against God? I mean, that sounds crazy. Uh, the world not believing in God, fine. Rejecting, rebelling, fine. But going to war against them, I and mean, that sounds crazy, unless, of course, the world sees the second coming in a different light because they've been deceived. And so this was, you know, uh, ideas that, that, that came to us in the 1990s and early 2000, and, uh, you know, it was quite groundbreaking for the time. And, um, you know, we got 270,000 views. It's not much today, but in 2006, not a lot of people were on the internet watching video. It was, it was on the most popular page of Google Video. When you went on the most popular page, there were six videos only, and ours was one of them. So it, it just um, uh, was the beginning of this calling, and it was resulted because of a, of a UFO sighting that I had in Iran. And there are other shows that I've done with you guys where we covered these things. In the deserts of Iran, I had a very close-up UFO sighting that launched me into this research. Um, and so to, tonight's talk is... It, it kind of a new territory that the Lord has brought me into. Um, I'll tell you just a very brief uh, story. Uh, I was preparing, I was doing some research for a very important uh, Christian writer who's one of the most famous in the whole world, actually. Uh, and I was doing some research for him, and um, I, I emailed him uh, what he'd asked, and then I went for a walk. Uh, and I, I was uh, uh, on this street that I hadn't been for a long time on. Um, I wasn't in my own neighborhood. Uh, and um, and there was a bookstore called Seekers. Uh, and it was kind of, kind of a basement bookstore. And, you know, in, in the days, you know, like uh, uh, in the 19, uh, late 80s and early 90s, you know, I, 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 I came to the Lord in 1991, in the summer of 91. Um, and so... I was myself a seeker, and this was a bookstore that I used to go to. It had books on all the religions of the world, and you know, esoteric stuff. And you know, even the first time when I wanted to read the Book of Enoch, I couldn't find it in any bookstore. It was, you know, it was like 1995, 1996, and I went to Seekers, and they had a Book of Enoch, and I was able to get one and and read it. Uh, so the uh, I was walking by this bookstore, and I thought, all right, Seekers, it's still here. Okay, I'm gonna just you know pop in there. And have a look for old time's sake. And as I'm walking around, I see a box of books by uh, where the the owner is standing. Um, and and suddenly the Holy Spirit comes over me in a strong way. And there's a book right there uh, about um, ancient mythology. Um, and it's a study of ancient mythology. And the Holy Spirit is like, you got you got to buy this book. And I'm like, oh, okay, I pick it up. I mean, it's a very strong urge. I, I recognize these ones because they come over me, and I do my best to obey them. And uh, and so I, I pick it up, and I say to the guy, uh, sir, I'd like to buy this book. And he says to me, um, well, I just got these books from the library. Uh, I haven't priced them yet, so uh, they're not for sale. And he turns around and continues his conversation with this other gentleman. And I thought, oh, no, no, I'm supposed to buy this book. So I said to him, I'll offer you 10 bucks for it. And he he's looked at me with round eyes. He said, $10, it's yours. I'm like, okay. So I got it and I came home and um, I opened it and had a section on Iran and I read that and it was very interesting. And I was like, okay. And it was just sitting on my desk. And then a few days later, I opened it to the Greek section. And it said that the Greek civilization began in a few cities in Greece and in the coast of Asia Minor and in Asia Minor, in a few cities in Greece and in Asia Minor. Now, I knew that, that, that Greece had started with, with, with Greece, like the, the cities of Athens and around that area. But Asia Minor, uh, which usually is associated with Turkey, looking you know backwards, that's where Turkey is. I hadn't realized, of course, it's just it's like a U, like it's like a reverse U, right? Imagine an upside down U. One side is Athens and the other side is Asia Minor. Oh, that, that, Greece. I don't know. As I read that sentence, I had a vision. In a door, I was standing on a door and this door opened and I fell through it. And I was, as I was falling through this door, that everything that I'm going to share with you tonight came into my consciousness at once and i began to check the the facts after the facts and and kept finding that what had come to me was exactly what the facts were 
and I knew then this was from the Lord. Um, and so it was, it was, it was quite a revelation. Um, I, 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 I was invited to talk about it on coast to coast. Uh, and, and there were some, uh, you know, attacks uh, at that time. Uh, I, I think, uh, because, uh, the enemy doesn't like his, um, his stuff revealed. Uh, but it was, oh, this was, this was really interesting and I'm still kind of chewing on it to be honest. And so, um, uh, I, I, I'm happy to be among friends here as I'm working through this. Uh, so let me start. There's some foundational information that has to be quickly laid. I won't dwell on these. We have talked about it in previous shows, um, uh, but it's important to have this understanding. Um, a very key passage is the Song of Moses, which is recorded in the fifth book of the Torah uh, called Deuteronomy in Greek and the Barim in Hebrew. Um, and this is in the 32nd chapter, verse 8 and 9. And I like to read it from the English Standard Version. It says, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. It's one of the sons of God passages. It says, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance. So God gave the nations, first of all, an inheritance, all the nations. He, they all have lands. They all have sections of this uh, earth that God created in the book of Genesis when he had the dry land emerge, uh, he then, you know, said, okay, all the, you know, the parrots will start here, the zebras will start here, and, you know, Adam will be in this garden. And so this, the nations, when they were formed after the flood of Noah, as we read in Genesis chapter 10, there are 70 nations. And those nations also got, gave them lands and inheritances, and they gradually moved into them. And he divided mankind, it says, and he fixed the borders of the people. So God fixed the borders after he did the division, which, as everyone knows, happened at the Tower of Babel. So this is a reference to that period of history uh, when God divided the people. And then we have this, you know, very important uh, addition of information about the spiritual authority that is over these nations. He fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Uh, ben ha Elohim in Hebrew, Ben ha Elohim, but the Lord's portion is His people, uh, Jacob, His allotted heritage. So there's a division where God takes Jacob for Himself, and that we see we see the same type of a division where God gives Abraham a piece of land, uh, you know, explains what the borders of that land will look like. Um, and uh, proclaims himself the protector of that land uh, and it then begins to place his temple there where his presence descends uh, all the way to the time uh, of the destruction of the temple from the time of Solomon's inauguration uh, where the glory of the Lord descends in the Holy of Holies. It will descend from then on every year on the Holy uh, uh, on the on, you know, on the Day of Atonement, uh, one of the appointed days that God chooses um, uh, out of the year, uh, on the calendar that He gives Moses, uh, He descends there all every year, once a year. His glory descends on the Day of Atonement from the time Solomon builds the temple to the time of uh, the Babylonian destruction of that temple, and it also we see the glory appearing in the Tent of Meeting uh, in the time of Moses, and so God makes His presence known. In, among his people, uh, and he gives, you know, uh, through the prophets his word, uh, and through the angels his laws, and finally he descends himself in the city of Jerusalem, uh, where he uh, does the most incredible thing and redeems Adam. So this becomes kind of the story of this particular land, but the other lands. Now, many of the Bibles that your listeners may have, because people may go and look at this in their Bibles and say, wait a second, my Bible says something else. Your Bibles may say that the nations were divided according to the number of the sons of Israel. And that is what the Masoretic text, which our English Bibles are based on, does record. And um, the uh, Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the books of Moses, um, and the, which was done you know, 207 years before the time of Christ, um, by these, you know, Jewish um, uh, rabbis or priests, basically, um, uh, because the Ptolemy, the uh, pharaoh of Egypt, uh, noticed that in the Library of Alexandria, 
uh, there was n all the laws of the gods existed in the library of Alexandria other than the laws of the God of Israel. And so he ordered that... Uh, uh, well, real, quick, the, real quick, before you get too far off from what you're talking about right there, a lot of people don't fully understand the whole Masoretic text. They don't realize you know, the time frame where that actually popped up. Right. That, that, that is key to, you know, that's the thing, because I'm still researching a lot of stuff about the history of the Bible and all the ancient manuscripts that, you know, how they all came to be and, you know, how right. we actually got our Bible. And that is, like I said, that's key that a lot of people don't understand that, that the Masoretic text came up at a certain time. But yes. there is ancient stuff that goes like like you mentioned the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation. It actually yes. predates it as well as some of the dead uh, all all of the Dead Sea Scrolls actually predate the Masoretic text. That's right, um, and so there is. It's good to check, you know, uh, those ancient manuscripts and see, you know, what was said. Perhaps after the time of Christ, uh, even, you know, sometimes the Jewish leadership who felt that uh, some of, I mean, of course, many Jews believed in the Lord. Uh, I was listening to this uh, 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 researcher recently, and he was saying that the Greek word in the New Testament, when it says that myriads, myriads of people believed in Jerusalem, that the Greek word myriad uh, would be around 50,000 people. And you have to understand that Jerusalem only had 70,000 people in it. So the number of people that believed in the Lord in Jerusalem was tremendous. Uh, it was, uh, it had, it had a you know, huge effect. Uh, so, but so the leadership, yes, did uh, maybe later change some things, like the Sons of God passages where it may have been altered. Um, and uh, this may have been a way um, for them to, you know, you know, put Israel in there. Uh, maybe it was a way of hiding something, and they would have made a note for themselves, and their own scribes would have made a note. Okay, this we changed, you know. But when the enemy does things like this, it actually draws, in some ways, more attention to it once it's discovered. Um, so the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation, was some, what the Lord quoted often, and Paul as well. And when Paul's letters were circulated among the churches. Because when the Jews, you know, they had their Old Testament, but when the Gentiles were coming on board and Paul was referencing the Old Testament constantly because that was the only scripture that existed for him, the Gentiles had to have a way of like go, see, going back and seeing like, what is he talking about? And so the, they were mostly Greek speaking. And so um, it was this Greek translation. So the Lord quoted from it. Paul quoted from it. It was used by the earliest and first church. And so it's, it's, it's it, it interesting. Was, it because, was around before Jesus actually came in the flesh. That's the thing. Yeah. Is it was around for a couple hundred years before Jesus actually yeah. descended upon the earth in flesh form. So. Yes, for 207 years. And so there... It says the sons of God, it says that, that the nations were divided and their boundaries were set and they were divided according to the number of the sons of God. It says that in this previous translation that was so authoritative and the Lord referred to this translation. Then when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in Qumran in 1947, the, uh, one of these uh, caves contained a piece of the book of Deuteronomy in Hebrew and that became the oldest Hebrew written manuscript that we have in our possession of this uh, part of the Bible. And yeah, because they, they say that the Dead Sea Scrolls actually predate about two to three hundred years before Jesus came. Yes, yeah, some of them do. Some of them are closer to his time. Some of them were written by the Essenes, and some of them, some of them the Essenes had older texts that they were safeguarding. They believed the apocalypse was going to happen, and they were hiding these texts inside of these caves, and they were going to offer it as a gift to the Messiah in his kingdom when he would take over. They believed it was imminent. It was going to happen. And so that's why they hid the stuff away. And so the, in there as well, it says sons of God. And so this is important to understand why, because it makes sense as we look at many, many, many other passages in the Bible that agree with this interpretation that behind the nations were these beings and God chose Israel for himself or Jacob for himself, same thing. Um, because we see that later in Daniel chapter 10, and we're going to pause on that. That's the next scripture we're looking at. Um, so actually, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it right now because we have a lot to cover, so there's no point. Um, so Daniel, uh, Rev, uh, Daniel ch chapter 10 is a passage that is key for tonight's conversation. 
I don't know why all these years uh, I have been staring at it. But you know that it is interesting how the the word the the Lord continuously says, "Look, it's the discernment comes from the Holy Spirit." not from your own brain. And so you can stare at something and then never see it. And then one day you're like, what? That's been there all this time. So in Daniel chapter 10, this angel comes to give an answer to Daniel's prayer. And he's late. Like Daniel began to pray 21 days ago. And when the angel gets to him and says, oh, Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I'm about to tell you and stand upright. He says, you know, don't be afraid when you humble yourself before God. God sent me, you know, right away to give you an answer. But what happened is that the prince of Persia he says, you know, I'll read, let me read from the scriptures. The first day you set your heart on understanding this and humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to your words. But the prince, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. So. This angel is coming to provide a message to Daniel, but he says that the power, the spiritual power behind the kingdom of Persia was stood against him for 21 days to the point he continues, then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. So he had to call for backup. And Michael, who we understand is the guardian of Israel, who is the one who arrests Satan at the end of this age and binds him in chains. You know, he's a very strong angel. He is one of the princes, and he came to contend with the prince of Persia so that this angel could then be freed and deliver this message of scriptural importance to the prophet Daniel. And this is one of the passages, for instance, that gives us that unveiling that God does sometimes and shows us what's behind the curtain that says, okay, you see, these sons of God were behind the nations. Here's one example. But it continues. After the message is given, the angel concludes by saying, um, in verse 20 of chapter 10, do you understand why I came to you? Uh, but I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I'm going forth and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. So again, now we have another guy, the prince of Greece. And the prince of Greece is going to be uh, basically the, one of the main topics for tonight, the prince of Greece. It, it's um, it, The Lord has opened my mind to understanding uh, things now through principalities and their territories rather than through nation states and because these guys live for you know for i don't know how long they live but but they live for uh, the entire history uh of of humanity at least you know satan has been around since the time of adam at least and god calls him an ancient a serpent so if god calls you ancient well, well <laughs> you gotta be old right well, that, well that's the thing is that they're supposed to be immortal and then on top of that when you get into the 72 gods like you were talking about I mean, that's the one that he pronounced judgment on and said, you will die like men. So yes. That's the so, thing. See, he didn't say you're going to be dead tomorrow. He just said that you will. He, that's the judgment that he laid on him is that ye shall die like men. Yes, in Psalm 82. Um, he does pass judgment over them. And so these guys you know, rule over various um, centuries. And in their territories, many nations rise and many empires rise and many kings rise. And some of these kings are Nephilim kings, uh, and, and then they fall and life goes on. But the key is to understand that the territory remains under their control. And so understanding their, their borders um, you know, gives us an insight, uh, and we're going to get into that in a second. So the prince of Greece and the prince of Persia, two principalities are mentioned here to us. Uh, and there is the third one, Michael. So there are three principalities mentioned here to us, the Prince of Persia, the Prince of Greece, and Michael. So here we see uh, that, that Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8 would make sense, for instance, if it was indeed the sons of God who are behind the nations. Why? Because, well, here's another passage that agrees with that translation. And then another passage that agrees with it, of course, is um, you know the temptation of the Lord where Satan says to him, that all the kingdoms of the earth have been given to me, they are under my dominion, that have been given to my dominion by God, and I will give them to whomever I will. And so I'll give them to you if you worship me. And, and the Lord says, but it's also written, worship only your God, God, you know, the Lord God, and so Satan behind me. And so there, there we, we have another insight into 
into these principalities that are behind the nations because Satan says, look, I am the one that's behind the nations. They, they are sacrificing to, to me and my angels. They, we, have, we, wear all these, we have all these names, um, depending on whether you look at Egypt or China or India uh, or Mesopotamia or Persia or Greece or Rome, but it's us. And of course, in chapter 32, it does tell us that the gods of the nations are demons. And later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I believe it's verse 20, Paul actually quotes the chapter 32 from Deuteronomy and says that, you know, the gods of the Greeks, of the Gentiles, depending on the translation, are demons. And I, w I don't want you to be sacrificing to demons. These are only some passages. I mean, I could pull out literally hundreds, literally, I could pull out hundreds of passages for you that would talk about these guys. For instance, the Passover passage where it says that God will judge the gods of Egypt. Well, again, as one of the gentlemen in our documentary says, you don't really put mythological beings under judgment. Um, and and God himself, you know, is referred to as the God of gods. And that's one of the titles the Lord has in Scripture. Like in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse uh, 17, it says that uh, Yahweh is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the El of the Elohim and the Adon of the Adonim. And so this is important to understand that God would not be the God of mythological beings. Um, so that's why, you know, these sorcerers had power to contend with Moses at the beginning until they, their power was outdone. But where did they get their power from? And of course, when you look at the birth of civilization and the incredible knowledge that is, was given to the various civilizations at the beginning, it's everyone is in agreement that this knowledge cannot be explained and our ancestors also claimed in their writings that this knowledge was given to them by the gods. The fact that, you know, um, uh, it was decided by really, we don't have time to get to it, but one guy, one guy decided. He was like 28, 29 years old, Marxist, Leninist, you know, a guy. He decided uh, to, to, to interpret Mesopotamian archaeology and said, okay, well, there was a farmers and then they, they were hunter-gatherers. One of them had a you know a spark of genius and he discovered farming and then later on they created all these stories to explain the birth of civilization as they could sit around the uh, the farm and think finally they came up with all of these bodies of knowledge and then they attributed it to these mythological beings they created and then this became the standard you know point of view this one guy came up with this and this became the standard view that was taught um to you know all the universities and all that stuff and we're going to get into the universities uh, later on today, um, and, and the secret societies and all that stuff. So the the um, the idea that our ancestors were crazy, all of them collectively, and they're all just deluded, talking about these guys as they're real. And well, that doesn't sound, you know, doesn't make sense to me because they seem to have been very intelligent guys who who came up with you know the rudiments of civilization that still carries us to this day. Um, and, of course, uh, the Word of God points to them as well. So there's a huge amount of uh, knowledge from Scripture, from history, from archaeology, from other writings, and, and, and again, from the Bible itself, that t tips the scale towards agreeing that the translation we find in Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls is the accurate one. And these princes that are behind these you know, uh, Paul points to them in his great Ephesian uh, letter when he, where he says, you know, we are fighting not flesh and bones, but powers and principalities in high places. In high places, well, these are the guys he's talking about. You know, the Prince of Persia, the Prince of Greece. So, uh, it's very important to understand the true reality that the Lord is unveiling this, and um, uh, this was uh, part of my personal spiritual journey because. No, I didn't learn this from anybody. I didn't read a book. The Lord literally, you know, took us on a journey and unveiled this for us. And, and you know, when we made our documentary and expressed these things, we didn't know there was anyone out there, anyone else other than us who who was talking about this. And, and this part of it, I think uh, there wasn't a lot of people talking about this anyways. So this was uh, a part of my spiritual journey that I'll touch uh, later on. So the, um, yeah, so let's launch into tonight's topic now that we have this foundational idea. Hey, and real quick, also, while since I uh, interrupted you real quick, um, your uh, microphone, is it rubbing up against your whiskers? Or is that uh, or are you turning pages? Because I keep hearing something in the background. Um, 
well, it may it may be a little bit of no. I'm not turning pages, so it must be that it's rubbing uh, against my whiskers, as you say. And so I'll I'll make sure I'm aware of that. Okay. Um, it it only gets like when you start getting excited and you're talking about things, it just kind of starts building and building. And like I said, I, for me, I can get past it, but the listeners out there, they might they might take issue with it. Yes, of course. Um, no, we want this to be very clean. So. At this point, I would encourage anyone who's listening who may be close to a laptop to uh, type in a few maps that I'm going to be pointing to. Uh, just because unless you have you know, the maps of, of the world's empires in your brain, uh, it, it, it will make more sense. So this was, the, the, this was how the whole thing began. Um, so if you type in, let's say, a GNC, a GNC, and Google will help you out with the spelling, it's A. E G E A N. If you type in Aegean C and then go on the image, the Google image, you know, you'll see this type of this body of water. And to the left of your screen, what you're seeing is Greece and Athens is there. To the right of your screen, what you're seeing is is the coast of Turkey. And right there, where this this piece of land is on the right side of your screen where the Turkish side of the Aegean Sea lies, right there are the, where the seven churches of the book of Revelation sit. They sit right there, you know, Ephesus and Sardis and Pergamum and Laodicea, and all of these seven churches are right here. Now, what's interesting is that the Persian Empire, and this, is, this was like suddenly, it's like the, the, the Lord gave me, the, as the thoughts were pouring in, the Persian Empire ended right here. Right here is where the Persian Empire ended. Um, so if you uh, looked at the territory of Persia, it, it engulfed all of Turkey, but it ended right at these cities. Um, it ended in a province called, um, um, uh, sorry, Latium. It's where Sardis was, you know, the Church of Sardis. That was, you know, the main uh, city of that province. And that is right where these ended. And when you look at um, uh, the, the, the Hebrew, the prince of Greece, you know, what is the prince of Greece? Well, in Hebrew, it says the prince of Javan. That's the Hebrew word uh, for Greece, Javan. And you go, well, who is Javan? Well, Javan, according to Genesis chapter 10, was the son of Magog. I'm mean, sorry, it was, the, it was the son of Japheth. So one of Japheth's son was Javan. And why do, does we, do we say the prince of Javan and why is Javan translated as Greece? Well, if you kind of Google now Greece and go to Wikipedia, you will learn that one of the founding tribes of Greece, there are four tribes that are the foundation of Greece. And one, there are two main tribes. And one of those main tribes is called Ionian. I-O-N-I-A-N. And that is the, the way that in English we say Javan. So in Hebrew they say Javan. We say Ionian, right? And where did these guys live? Well, these guys lived where those seven churches were. These guys lived in the coast of Asia Minor. These guys lived in what is modern-day Turkey. There are all these Turkish, you know, all-you-can-eat resorts right now on the Aegean. And right now, the Turkish, you know, lira has collapsed completely. It's actually, you know, a cheap time to go on vacation there. Right here, where these seven churches were, where the Persian Empire ended, began a new territory. And this was the territory of the tribe of the Ionians that the Bible calls Javan, that we in English call Greece. And the Bible tells us the prince of Javan, the prince of Ionians, the prince of Greece. And it is here where the altar of Zeus, of course, stood as well. This was the beginning of a new territory. Uh, on the on the left hand side will be the realm of the prince of Greece. On the right-hand side, the realm of the prince of Persia. When I say right-hand side, I mean n not including this chunk of land where, where the uh, Javans, uh, the tribe of Javan live, where the Ionians live, where the seven churches were. This falls within the realm of the prince of Greece, a little bit you know, east of that. 
So if you go north, uh, if you Google, let's say now, let's say Istanbul, Istanbul, and you click on Istanbul, um, if you click on the map uh, of Istanbul, uh, let's say you, you know, you zoom out a little bit. So right now I'm on the map of, of Istanbul, I, I typed Istanbul in Google and I got the map and you zoom out. Um, now, the city, Istanbul is a very interesting city. Um, it has a bridge in it. And when you go on this bridge, on one side of the bridge, when you come off the bridge, you are in Europe, in the European continental mass. In Europe, you're in the European continent. When you get on the same bridge and drive your car to the other side of the bridge, when you come off the bridge, you are in Asia. This is where Asia as a continent and Europe as a continent, like two fingers that touch each other, this in the city of Istanbul, just north of this, where the seven churches were, where, where you know, uh, Greece began, this is where these two continents meet. So if you draw a line through it, going diagonally from north to south, everything to the left or to the west of this is the territory of the prince of Greece, of Javan. And everything to the other side of it falls within the realm of the prince of Persia. And what are the boundaries of these princes? I'm going to show that to you later in the show by following their symbols. Um, it's going to be interesting. Um, my understanding of, of, of how Satan's hierarchy is divided and these principalities work has suddenly you know, shifted dramatically. I, I've come up with some you know, new insight into it. But for now, let's just say that everything left you know, is the west so you got europe uh you know starting with greece and then you have europe and then you have the colonies which is the americas which are just an extension of europe you know the english and the french to the north the spanish and the portuguese to the south the kingdoms of europe you know extending themselves into the new world and believe it or not moscow lies squarely west of this land moscow lies within the realm of the Prince of Greece, so does all of Eastern Europe, and that's why Moscow has the symbol of the eagle, and we're going to talk about that in detail later. So uh, just territory-wise, I wanted to kind of uh, uh, establish this. Uh, so so the uh, coming back to the Aegean Sea, to that U, um, on the left you have Greece and you have Athens. On the right you have Turkey, and, and you have the seven churches. And this U is actually where, you know, the realm of the prince of Greece began. This is where Greece began. This was, you know, when you look at Babylon in Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq, and you look at Egypt in Africa, and you look at Assyria in the Middle East, and you look at Babylon, you look at Medo-Persia, these civilizations are older than the Greek world and uh, than the Western world. While this stuff was brewing, and, and they had their own history, uh, well, slowly, to the left of them, to the west of them, this new thing was brewing. And once the Persian Empire reached the borders uh, of this land, and eventually it, 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 it came, its time came to pass, yes, the prince of Greece did rise uh, under you know, Alexander the Great, who was one of the beasts. He was, in, he was I'm pretty sure now, nearly 100% that he was a Nephilim. You know, the, uh, under Alexander, the prince of Greece rose, conquered the previous empires and started something new that continues all the way to this day and essentially has just landed on the shores of California. And I'm going to kind of walk you through it all, uh, that, the, that the realm of the Prince of Greece has Bobby. never ceased. Yes. Hello? Oh. You broke up pretty bad there about the last 20 seconds. Okay, okay. Can you so, go back and capture that again, please? Yes. So the... Yeah. Um, when you look at this U, um, where the Aegean Sea is, to the left you have Greece and you have Athens, and when you come down to the right of it, you have Turkey, and this U um, is exactly kind of you know where the realm of the Prince of Persia ended. So if you look at the older empires like Egypt, like Assyria, uh, like Babylon, like Medo Persia, all of these things are kind of to the east. They're kind of growing and growing, and once the final empire, that's per the Persian Empire, reaches this border land, suddenly, in the realm of, of the Prince of Greece, seeds had been planted of a new kingdom. And this kingdom is now ready to 
op- open up its appeal dimension on the stage of world history. And so Alexander the Great, who I'm convinced was a Nephilim, arises on the leadership uh, of the Prince of Greece, and he then takes over the realms and the empires and the kingdoms before and establishes the West. Um, and and this empire of the Prince of Greece only grows. It only grows. You know, it grows to become Rome. It grows to become, you know, the, the, the cities of Europe, the kingdoms of Europe. And from there, it pours into the New World, which is an extension of the kingdoms of Europe, the French and the English to the north, the Spanish and the Portuguese to the south. And so the, the realm of the Prince of Greece, which begins at the time of Alexander, is only now settling on the shores of California. It continues throughout the ages uh, because the Prince of Greece is the most important of all the princes, and the Lord talks about that. I'm going to open that up in a moment. Uh, Before we leave this map, there's one more thing that has to be pointed to, and that is the island of Crete. So if you come south uh, of this U, you got the Aegean Sea, and you have, you know, what's now Greece and Turkey on either side, but back then it was you know, just the beginnings of this new kingdom, of the realm of, of, of the Prince of Greece. This is where Western civilization began. So when you look at Crete, uh, archaeologists tell us that Western civilization has its uh, birth in the island of Crete, meaning that when you kind of uh, look into what is Western civilization, and then you kind of go to the Romans, and you go to the Greeks, and then you start to kind of rummage around the Greek lands to see, like, where was the oldest, oldest, oldest place where we see the birth of what we consider Western civilization, where it is found in the island of Crete, in this island. And I'm going to tell you why um, and, and why that is. So in order to understand, to understand that, we need to focus now on the clue that the Lord leaves us. It's a very important part of the puzzle. And the clue that the Lord leaves us is found in the book of Revelation in chapter 2, where, you know, the um, Lord writes seven letters to seven Christian congregations in Asia Minor, where in the Aegean Sea, right here, where the uh, tribe of Javan, the son of Japhet, uh, the one who we know as, as Greece, you know, that each time you read the word Greece or Greek, in the Old Testament, um, it is actually a translation of the Hebrew word Javan, which is one of the sons of Japhet. So the prince of Greece is the prince of Javan, and the tribes of Javan settled in what is today Asia Minor or Turkey by the coastline, by the Aegean Sea, where the uh, power of Persia ended, a new realm began. And so there are seven congregations, and there's a reason, there's a very specific reason I now realize why the Lord wrote to himself personally these letters to these seven congregations, and, and on, out of all the congregations that existed. I'm going to show that to you in a second. So the, the clue is found in the message to Pergamum. And uh, this is where it ties into my personal story. This was very important to us. Um, I'll read it for you. In verse 13, it says, uh, so I'll read from verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, and you can Google where that is, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword, say this. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So, in this verse 13, the Lord makes two references to Satan. One, he, he says that this is where Satan's throne is. And the other is that he says, you know, this is where Satan dwells. So these are, you know, knowing, knowing you know, the history that Scripture has with Satan, this very important character in God's kingdom who decided that he wanted to be worshipped as an idol. He wanted to be worshipped as the most important of, of all the idols. He wanted to be worshipped as the first principle of the universe, and, and that is where the root of idol worship even begins, right? Uh, the, uh, the ambition of Satan to be worshipped is the root of idol worship, and what Paul teaches us in his letter to the Romans is that um, idol worship, he defines it as the worship of the creature as opposed to the worship of the creator. He says it's the worship of the creation as opposed to the worship of the creator. 
So when angels, like he says to the Colossians, abstain from, you know, the worship of angels. So when angels request to be worshipped, they become idols. And Satan, and that's why the first of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Um, because this is the very beginning of what pulls us away from that relationship, which is a source of life and knowledge and healing and truth and love and everything that is good. Uh, so so this, this is where Satan's throne was, the Lord reveals that, and where Satan dwells, and he talks about his faithful um, servant, Antipas, who was the bishop of the congregation. He was the head of the church of that town of Pergamum. Um, who is martyred, who, who is my witness, and I want to talk about him. The, um, this is, uh, was interesting because in um, 1996, uh, I walked up to a Bible study where, where I was attending, and the teacher said to me, you know, I know where Satan's throne is. And this was after, you know, we had discovered about the relationship between, you know, the UFOs and the chariots that are in the Bible, and we had now understood the relationship between the sons of God and the Nephilim, and and, and the Lord was like literally every week opening us, we were on a wild ride, and it's just like, you know, we weren't reading these things in anyone's books, this was just like, as we were studying, the Lord was just pouring this knowledge into us as, 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 as a gift, and so suddenly I come up, and he's like, I know where Satan's throne is. And I was like, whoa, there's something else? What's this about now? So I, I was a student, a graduate student at the University of Toronto. And when I went to look up the city of Pergamum, I found the notes of the archaeologist Carl Human, who had dug up the altar of Zeus. And he said that if uh, if, if Christ uh, was referring to anything uh, at all of significance, of spiritual significance, of pagan spiritual significance in this city, well, it must have been this altar because this was the most important altar of Zeus uh, in the entire ancient world. And, um, you know, when you look at Zeus, um, he was the chief deity of, you know, uh, in the Greek pantheon. And he was worshipped, but it was more than that. Uh, when you look at the altar, what was depicted on it was this battle between um, the Titans, which is the Greek word for Nephilim, and the Titans. So uh, it's like fall, it's like fake news. It was basically it was a big piece of fake news was recorded on it, where the Titans uh, were presented as these you know these enemies of, of man that had risen to destroy man. And had rebelled against the order of the gods and of man. And the gods, under the leadership of Zeus, came to the rescue of man and destroyed the Titans. And reestablished the post-Diluvian order and brought the light of civilization. And, and the purpose of civilization was to bring order, to bring peace, to bring knowledge, to bring the order of the gods under the leadership of Zeus. And to bring this civilization and to all the nations, and to bring the guardianship, because they sacrificed to Zeus, the guardianship of Zeus to all of these nations. Um, and this was the purpose of empire building, even from their point of view, it was a holy thing in some ways, it was bringing the order of Zeus. And this altar recorded a story on it, a, a very important story. And the story was that this is the foundation of the post diluvian world under this, you know, this, this, this uh, deity, Zeus, and their sacrifices were made to him 24-7. It was a very important, you know, place. And when uh, Rome eventually, you know, came uh, of age and, and, and took over the, the world of the Greeks, uh, it adopted Zeus as its deity. It continued to worship him. It simply called him, you know, uh, Jupiter, uh, which, which means kind of, you know, the sky god, uh, is Deus Pater? That's where it comes from. Uh, it, it, it's it's like saying you know the Father God. You know he he was he was you know the the main the main deity, and so the Roman emperors um, as also understood that they were continuing this Zeusian civilization, and that is why at the time of the Lord and at the time of the writing of this letter. Uh, People were sacrificing in this altar to Zeus from all over the Greco-Roman Empire, and that's why there are sacrifices being offered in it 24 hours, seven days a week, because it was such an important place 
of you know spiritual significance and it was to this deity and to the post diluvian order that he had established by defeating the nephilim that the greco roman world owed their civilization and their peace and their prosperity so it was it was the main you know spiritual center and when you look at these guys um in the house i mean you look at the the architecture of it um, there was um, attached to this uh, the altar was uh, a library, and this library, after Alexandria, was the most important library in the whole world, and so there was a lot of the knowledge of the gods were being guarded there, uh, and the knowledge of civilization was being guarded there, uh, and then down down from the altar was the village, and so you saw kind of the priests you know, and and their knowledge and their God and the people connected. And then to the other side of the altar was the royal palace where the house of rule was connected. And there was a purpose to this architecture because a lot of the priests of Jupiter and the priests of the various gods like Apollo and these guys were senators and politicians in the Roman Empire. It was very, 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 very common for uh, priests to be politicians in the Roman Empire because there was no division between the worship of the gods and the building of empire and rule. They were one and the same, kind of like the world of Islam that sees the extension of the Islamic empire as being what you know Allah requires. And the caliph is the one who is the head of this caliphate who is to bring the laws of Allah to you know the people that are under it. It was the same. And so... Um, this was a very important, you know, this 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 was a very important city. This was a very important altar, and um, one of the symbols of Zeus, you know, was the bull. And so the bull, the brazen bull, sat in this altar as a sacrificial space. And so when Antipas was arrested, he was taken and he was put inside of this bull made of bronze. And a fire was lit under him, and he slowly cooked in there. And they had put these um, mechanisms in the mouth of this brazen bull in order to amplify the moans and groans of the human sacrifice that would be offered in, in order to bring the bull to life and animate it. This was an offering to Zeus. In the case of Antipas, church historians record that he prayed till his last breath for his congregation that he was serving as a bishop. And the reason he had been arrested was because he proclaimed the monotheism of the Jews. He had converted from Paul and the worship of Zeus to monotheism. And this was an offense to the polytheists and to the power of their God, whom they saw was behind the empire. And we see this later as well in the period of Christian persecution in the Roman Empire, the main reason the Christian citizens of Rome were arrested and killed was because they refused to sacrifice to the gods, and this would weaken the empire and the emperor. Um, the last persecution, the greatest of all of the persecutions, the tenth one, the Lord did say to the church of Smyrna that there will be ten days of persecution, and there was exactly ten emperors, ten periods of, of ten periods, not ten emperors, but ten periods of Christian persecution carried out by Rome. And the tenth one was carried out by Diocletian. And Diocletian didn't know what to do with his Christian citizens. They kept growing. The more they, 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 the emperors killed them, the more they grew. The more citizens became you know, converted to the monotheism of the Jews and accepted the Jewish Messiah you know, as their own and were being grafted into the covenant that God had made with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And all the families of the earth were being blessed in the seed of Abraham. And so God was calling the nations back to himself and freeing them from the bondage of these spiritual forces. Um, and, and he did proclaim this. He did proclaim it um, when he took his disciples for a walk uh, to um, Caesarea Philippi. He proclaimed it there that his power would rise and the power of – because Caesarea Philippi was a, was a huge you know, a, a place of many temples to many deities – and there was a sacrificial altar at the, at the bottom, which was called the Gate of Hades. 
And this is where the Lord made his big speech that these forces are going to now be humbled and I and my church are going to rise and the gates of Hades cannot withstand them, which was the power of these you know, spiritual forces. So as, as people in Rome were being freed and the, Lord was, the Holy Spirit was pushing back, the Diocletian sent the messenger to uh, the sun god Apollo, whom the Mesopotamians knew beforehand as Shams, but the Greeks called him Apollo. He sent, you know, an oracle to Delphi and said, what should I do with the Christians? And, and, and the response came, the Christians are the enemies of the gods. Uh, and so Diocletian, you know, um, uh, stopped their civil rights. He proclaimed the civil rights of Christian citizens to be void. He then uh, confiscated all their Bibles and burnt them. And then he uh, arrested them and had them tortured until they sacrificed the gods or died. And he killed more Christians alone than all the other nine persecutions before him combined. But the order came from Apollo, who proclaimed the Christians the enemy of the gods. So this, what we see here happening to Antipas is only the beginning. It's only the beginning of a great persecution that will go on for nearly 400 years without cease. And so um, this was a battle with these fallen angels. Why? Because the Lord was freeing the nations from the bondage to these beings, the way that he had freed Israel from the gods of Egypt uh, at the Passover. And who's the Passover lamb where we believe that Jesus is the Passover lamb, that the Passover lamb was a symbol of the Messiah. And that is why he was crucified on the Passover. And that is why he had a Passover meal or Seder. And he pointed to himself being the lamb because he lifted up the third cup of wine that is drunk by the Jews during the Passover, and this cup, uh, you know, pointed to the blood of the Lamb um, of Egypt, and he said, this is my blood, and this is the blood of the new covenant. And so he made himself the Lamb in that moment, and in that moment he ushered in the new covenant by saying those words. And so this was the freedom of Egypt that came to Israel at the time of the Exodus, was now coming to the nations. And so the same way that Egypt, that the Jews had been freed from Egypt's gods or the fallen angels, now the Romans and the Greeks were being. So God was pouring his Holy Spirit into the realm of the prince of Greece, very specifically. Um, and that is when he told Paul to go west when he had the dream. He told Paul, go to west. And so he sent, you know, perhaps his greatest missionary into the land of, of, of the prince of Greece. But here the Lord does something very interesting for us. He connects the prince of Greece, uh, who was Zeus and Jupiter, to Satan by pointing to this throne in Pergamum. And I agree, and everyone agrees, really, who looks into this with Carl Heumann, the German archaeologist, who in, in, I think was 1879 or 1897, one of those two, uh, if I'm not, I may be having a dyslexic moment looking at my notes, when he discovered um, this altar of Zeus, 1878, 1879, Carl Heumann, he unearthed the most elaborate, elegant, and best preserved altar of the Greek god Zeus, known as Jupiter by the Romans. And, and so um, he, you know, shipped this altar, he shipped it all the way to Germany yeah, after he got permission from the Ottoman emperor who, who now ruled this land. He shipped it to Germany. And um, this group of people that I'm looking into right now petitioned the German government and they said, you know what, we can't have this altar displayed in chunks and pieces as all archeolo archaeological stuff were displayed that way. We need to build a museum that can house this entire altar whole. We need to reassemble this altar, you know, inside of this museum. And so they did. They, they won these guys. They, the government accepted their petition. They built this altar it was reassembled in Germany, in Berlin, and then it was inaugurated for people to come and see this grandiose altar of Zeus. And one of the people that walks in the museum to see it is uh, Albert Speer, who was the architect of Hitler, of Adolf Hitler. And he gets inspired and he says, oh, I want to build one of these for Hitler. And so in the city of Nuremberg, if you can Google you know, Nuremberg rallies, you'll see a gigantic version of this altar built for Hitler where the Nuremberg rallies were held. And these Nuremberg rallies were incredible. You know, they, uh, uh, he said that he, uh, Hitler told Albert Speer that he wanted a cathedral of light. Um, and, and no, he wanted, sorry, he said to Albert Speer that he wanted the, the, these rallies 
to have the solemnness of a Catholic mass, you know. Uh, and so he built this uh, in Nuremberg. Uh, Albert Speer put these um, German army uh, lights every 30 feet all around the, the area where the uh, rallies were held, where this altar stood. And at night when he would light them, it looked like these pillars of light were surrounding this area. It, it looked like pillars going up but made of light. And so it was called the Cathedral of Light. And Hitler stood on this altar. And one day when he was standing there, he, st where did he stand? Where, where the bull was, where the brazen bull was, where Antipas was, you know, uh, killed. Um, the, Albert Speer put a podium for Hitler there. He put a microphone where the bull was. And standing on that microphone, it is from that specific place that for the first time, Adolf Hitler declares a new burnt offering, or as we say, Holocaust. And he is there that he declares, you know, that the Jews should be rounded up and killed as they're coming back to the land, as they're coming back to fulfill prophecy, as they're coming back to establish what eventually will be the Messianic kingdom, the return of, of Christ. Uh, you know, uh, the enemy sets up his altar there and says, no, let's stop this because instead of the kingdom of the Messiah, we want to have the 1000 year Reich of Germany. And so I just wanted to give you kind of a glimpse of where we're going and how it's just going to lead us into the kingdom of the Antichrist and understanding the territory of the final beast empire and where the Antichrist will emerge from. But let me now go back to the ancient history and now build it up all, all the way for you to modern times so you can understand the unfolding of the realm of the Prince of Greece as it begins with Alexander the Great at where the, where the realm of the Prince of Persia ends and the, and the Prince of Greece begins, whom the Lord identifies for us as Satan and places and points to his throne. And, and now I see why the Lord pointed to this throne, because it was the most significant you know, altar to Zeus. It was the most, one of the most sig significant place of spiritual worship in all of the ancient world. I didn't know that. So I came back and I said to my teacher, you know, um, you know uh, Carl Human agrees with you. It seems that the throne of Satan was there and it was this altar to Zeus. And so then we thought to ourselves, why, why would the Lord, you know, connect this Greek deity, this head of the Greek pantheon to Satan? And just with that thought alone, just asking that question, just asking that question, why would the Lord connect these two things together if that's in fact what is happening here? Just asking that question prompted the response from the Lord into our consciousness. Wait a second, the gods of the ancient world were actually the fallen angels? And the head of the pantheon was Satan? And, 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 and Zeus was the head of the pantheon? And so... Then that prompted me, of course, to print out every single passage in the Old and New Testament in which the word gods were mentioned. And as I studied them all, I noticed that they fell into four categories. And one of the categories they fell into clearly, clearly, so many times God spoke about these guys as though they were real beings, admonished them, told them to worship him, um, you know, they talked about their power, talk, uh, judged them. Uh, so, so then I knew that, you know, as I, and Daniel 10, you know, the temptation of Christ and the conversation with Satan, suddenly through this passage and this revelation, the Lord opened us, opened this huge scriptural in, enigma for us, uh, which then allowed me to understand that if in the ancient times, uh, Satan and his angels had posed as gods, their new mask in the modern world was aliens. They were now putting on a new mask and that's why you know, one of the uh, chapters of our documentary is it talks about the strategies of Satan throughout the ages and how they were, you know, gods in the ancient world and aliens in the modern world. And so this was this was the key passage that unlocked that connection. And the, the prince of Greece. So now we know that the prince of Greece is actually Satan for himself. So even though there's all these principalities that have the different parts of the world and they are sub-principalities that are over specific nations and over specific regions, but there are two principalities that are at the very top of the food chain whose territories are key. And that is the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece. And that is why these two are uh, highlighted for us by the Holy Scriptures, by the Word of God. And that is why they're highlighted for us in this very important story where an angel is coming to speak to Daniel, and, and he doesn't know, that angel doesn't know when he's coming that he's going to become part of Scripture. 
and his story and his uh, fight with the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece is going to be of scriptural importance. God wanted that revealed to us and wanted that angel to be in conflict, wanted that conflict to be recorded so that we could understand. But it's important because God does not, you know, mince his words or speak in vain. Everything in scripture is there with great precision of all the principalities. Why? Why these three were pointed out, Persia, Greece, and, and Michael? And this is what I mean, that all this time, it was right in front of my face. I, you know, I, I've been reading this uh, uh, since 1996 for, with this in mind. And yet it's only now that I, the idea came to me, why these three? Why these three of all the powers and principalities? Why are only three named by God specifically, Greece, Persia, and Michael? Well, Michael, we know, stands behind Israel. But let me now tell you about Greece and Persia. But let's focus on Greece because that is it's Satan. And so of all these empires, Satan decides to take a chunk of the territory of the world and that he is going to make for himself. That will be his backyard. That will be where his scepter of power will rise. His, his other guys under him have their own territories that God has given them. And the Prince of Persia is, it looks to me, the second in command. Um, but the Prince of Greece, you know, is the one that is the top of the food chain. And that is why from the time where Alexander rises to the time where the district, district of Colombia, you know, arises and, and the Soviet Union, all of these guys from you know, the Russia, uh, you know, all of the uh, European nations, the uh, Charlemagne, Napoleon, the King of Spain, um, the, the, the British Empire and the District of Columbia, all, from the time of Alexander all the way to D.C., all of this is the realm of the Prince of Greece. And always has this section of the world been the dominant, this is where the most economic power lies, it is where the greatest military might rise from Moscow to D.C., and it is where the greatest knowledge lies. And we know that knowledge has come from the fallen angels going back to the time of Enoch, the sciences that are the basis of, you know, the weapons um, and, and the technology that, that rules the world. Uh, and the greatest political power r lies, you know, whether it's Greece, whether it's Rome, whether it's Europe, whether it's America, whether it's Russia. It is in the west part. If, if you go to that city where Europe and Asia meet, Istanbul, and you draw a line, you'll see, you know, the west. And, and I'm going to come back to these things again, in greater detail so that, so that the people listening, you know, can, can appreciate more the foundation of these ideas as I open it up for you. So you see how I come to these conclusions. I will, I will take you step by step through it. Um, so this, this section of the world, you see the, one of the mistakes that we've been making so far in our thinking, it's not such a mistake. It's just this, it's the way we've been taught. We read the Prince of Greece and then we go, well, the Greeks ruled under Alexander. Then, then the Romans came and then, you know, then the European scan, it goes on and on and on. And, and then we, because we say in our heads, Prince of Greece, and then we look at the ancient Greeks and we go, oh, wow, they, these guys had this guy over them. Uh, no, the, that guy still is around. That Prince of Greece guy is still around. He has continued through many, many, many imperial houses. But his symbols, this is how you know him. You see, what are his symbols? Well, one of his symbols that he loved uh, was um, uh, was called Atelus Deus, which is um, uh, which is um, uh, the the eagle, and you see the eagle, um, and then you see the eagle, of course, in um, you know the Roman flags, uh, you know the, the the big thing the Romans would would hold when they went to war, the the eagle of Rome. Uh, you see it in the European flags, the Spanish flag, Napoleon's eagle, the, the Nazi eagle. You see it in the American um, symbology of power. Um, and so the eagle is one of the ways you know it. Now, when um, in 1453, uh, when the Muslims became strong enough to take on the last Christian stronghold in the East, Constantinopolis, that city where Europe and Asia meet, in Turkey, well, that was not always called Istanbul. That was called Constantinopolis. And it was the last bastion of Christianity in the East. And it fell in 1453 to the rising Muslim armies. And when that happened, the princess uh, uh, left Constantinopolis and moved to Moscow. 
Usk and married into the royal family of Moscow. And because of that, the royal household of Moscow declared that they were now the third Rome, the first Rome being Rome, the second Rome being Constantinople, the third Rome, Moscow. And from henceforth, they declared that they will now be called Tsar, which is the Slavic term for Caesar. So in, in, in English, we use, you know, something that I think sounds more like the Latin Caesar, because we hail to the west of, you know, the Rome of the city of Rome. You know, we are we we follow that tradition. So we say Caesar uh, in Germany, they call it Kaiser and in Russia, they call it Tsar. But this is all the same term. And so Moscow then becomes the third Rome. The, the king becomes known as Caesar and the two headed eagle of Byzantium, the two headed eagle of Constantinople is adopted by Moscow henceforth as as its symbol. And that's why when you look at on the Russian flag today, you'll see a horseman and you'll see him holding a shield. And on this shield, you'll see the two headed eagle of Byzantium. Again, you see the symbol of Zeus. All and and and, and as I said, if you drew a line uh, through Constantinople or or Istanbul, you'll see that Moscow lies in the west of it, in the same realm as, as the prince of greece's realm so all the way from moscow to dc all of europe you know from ancient greece to, to rome to the europe to the americas in the colonies all of them from canada to argentina this is all the realm of the prince of greece he continues to rule he may have other guys under him and he certainly does but this is where satan has planted his backyard and the altar the throne which was in Pergamum, which was where exactly the uh, Persian Empire ended and, and the Greek lands began. Not only the Greek lands, but the territories of Javan, the son of Japhet, the very name that God, the Holy Spirit, uses when talking about this prince, the prince of Javan, he is called, because his territory begins right there in the lands of Javan. Which is, which is, you know, the Asian coast, which is where the Western civilization began. This is where the altar lied. And this altar's arms, because, you know, it looked like a U, if you Google it, pointed westward. And I think there's a reason it pointed westward, because Satan planted his throne there and looked west, you know, at his territories. Now, why did the Lord send Paul west and, and, and send the Holy Spirit in the direction of the Prince of Greece? Because, you know, that's where... Satan's realm was, and the Lord was challenging it with his whole, with his salvation. Um, is 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 did Satan set up there, knowing that you know this is the direction that the Holy Spirit was going to go? Um, uh, I don't know, uh, but the Lord began to free these people, and you know why did he write that letter himself to those to to the to that land, those seven letters? Because he wrote it to to the very Genesis. Of the of, of of this empire of, of of the prince of Greece's lands of Satan's own you know the part of the earth that he has chosen as his imperial scepter, he uh, he wrote those letters there. He challenged his the basis of his authority. And when did he challenge it? He challenged it when he ascended to the Father, and then, as it says in the vision of the prophet Daniel in chapter seven, that he saw the Son of Man ascend to the ancient of days and receive the scepter of rule over all nations, kindred, and tongues. And when the Lord ascended, as the book of Revelation records, and John sees it as well, as the Lamb of God ascends, and, and all everyone says, who is worthy to open the scrolls? And it's the Lamb who is worthy. And when he does open the scrolls, he and he receives the deed of the earth, that's what those scrolls are, because in the Greek-Roman tr tradition, you know, when you, you receive the deed of your house, and it would have these seals. And when, when you had paid all your mortgage off, the, the, the seals would be torn and the deed would be yours. But not until you had paid your mortgage. And what did the Lord say on the cross? Totalestai, which means it's paid in full. He paid the price and he took the deed. And when he received the scepter from the Father, then he wrote a letter to Pergamum challenging the throne of Satan. And he was saying, now... Things have changed. I am calling the families of the earth out of the judgment. They had been given to you, and we, and I had only taken Israel for myself, and you and the sons of God were ruling them. But now, but now, I have received the scepter of power. I, the son of King David, and my throne will be the only legitimate throne in the whole earth, among all the nations. Only the throne of King David is recognized by heaven as the only throne on earth 
no longer the throne of Pergamum, no longer that throne. But when that throne reemerges, we see you know, the rise of anti-Semitism in Russia. We see it leading to the Holocaust and the Third Reich and, and, this, th- and this wall that's created. You know, There's a footage I saw on the Internet of, of I don't know if it's an English or American you know, uh, um, airplane bombing that throne uh, from the sky at the end of the war. And that, that the one that Albert Speer builds for Hitler from where he declares the Holocaust. So you have the symbol of the eagles that stands. So, so the prince of Greece's realm is well and alive and kicking and ticking. And it continues to be the dominant power of, of the world. Every, if, you take, if you connect it, you know, Moscow and Europe and America together, you would have the most important power in the whole world, right? Um, who, who will stand against that beast? Russia? I mean, uh, China? No. Who else is left? India? Africa? Who's going to stand up against that beast? Right? So if you connect all the eagles together, then you have the symbol of the bull. And that's very interesting. So what happens with the bull is that if we go back to the whole agency, um, uh, that whole, you know, the birth of Western civilization, I said, began in the agency. Well, if you go back to the to that map of the Aegean Sea, you will see that in the very north of it, there is a there is was a territory, a country, if you will, called Thrace, T H R A C E, Thrace, and that is where the name Europa comes from. Europa was a princess of Thrace. That is where the name Europe even comes from. The name Europe comes. That region was called Europe. Originally, that region was called Europe. Now, the story is that Satan transforms himself, or Zeus, I should say, it becomes a bull, a white bull. He then kidnaps the princess Europa and takes her where? To the island of Crete. You remember I said archaeologists tell us that Western civilization began in Crete? Yes. And do you know who is the first king of Crete? Who is the first king of this Western world? Who is the first king of this ancient, um, the rise of the realm of the Prince of Greece? Minos, the son of Europa and Zeus. So if Zeus, in fact, is Satan, if that is the clue the Lord is giving us to follow, then and he transforms himself into a white bull, and he kidnaps Europa, and he takes her to the island of Crete, where he fathers Minos, King Minos, the first king, and he's a Nephilim. Well, guess what? I discovered that virtually all the seven churches have, according to Greek history, have Nephilim founders. For instance, Pergamum, where this altar was. Well, you got this altar, but then you go in, right? What was in it? Inside of it, in the middle of it, was a sacrificial uh, altar. So you've got kind of this big statue, this big U that you can see if you go Pergamum altar on Wikipedia or any place else you see it. This thing that's in Berlin today, but in the in, when you went through the doors, there was a place for offering the burnt the sacrifices, and that was you know that was actually the altar that was the heart of it, and all around it was the story of Telephus depicted. Telephus was the founder of the city of Pergamum. Who was Telephus? Well, Telephus was the son of Hercules, who was the son of Zeus. So the the bloodline you know of a Zeus becomes the foundation of his Western world. And these bloodlines continue to be in his realm all the way uh, into the, into the houses of power to this day, all the way they, they continue. So he, he, there, he, he sets his scepter of rule. Satan does in, in, in the West. He then uh, begins to father the Kings of the West. The founding Kings of the Western world were Nephilim starting with King Minos, the first one. And that is why archaeologists have found the most ancient site, you know, in Crete. And Telephus is the founder of Pergamon, but Sardis has also another uh, founder, that's a Nephilim, son of Hercules. And and that's all interesting as it seems. I mean, it's, it's interesting right there, but it gets more interesting. So when you go and look at the history, if you go to, if you go and, you know, Wikipedia, Greece, you go back, okay, I want to know more about Greece. Greece has become so important. I tell you, all of this started with that book that I found in that, in that bookstore that the Lord said, buy this book. And I came and that's one line that, you know, Greece began in Asia Minor. This is, that's how, this, this all just, 
you know, and I, the more I looked into it, the more the pieces came together. So the the Greeks, I- according to you know Wikipedia, just it's just basic history. It's not not a mystery. There are four tribes that are the foundation of the Greek world of the Western world. One of these tribes is the two most important of these tribes are, are the tribe of Javan, whom who are according to the Jewish, you know, scriptures, uh, according to the Book of Genesis, Javan is the son of Japhet. And they live in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and, and is where the seven churches were, where the prince of Javan gets its name from, the prince of Greece, because that's where the realm began, that's where his throne was. But then the other tribe, that is the other more important tribe, they're both, they're two tribes, is, are the Doreans. And as I said, the Aegean Sea, where Western civilization began, has Crete in the south. It's like that's the bottom of it. That's where King Minos, you know, uh, the son of Zeus in Europe, lived, the first king of Europe. And then to the east of it is where the throne was, the seven churches. All of those are founded cities founded by uh, Nephilim, mostly related to Hercules. And then you have, you know, uh, to to the west of it is where Athens is and where Greek Greece proper is, like modern day Greece. And uh, you look at, for instance, the, the Spartans, the great Spartans, they understood themselves to be the sons of Hercules, which makes sense why they might have had you know, such great strength. And then you have the people that lived there, the the tribe that, that lived in that western section where Athens is, where Greek proper is, is the other more the important tribe, and they're called the Doreans. And these are the two main tribes, Ionians or Javan, as the Bible calls them, in the east, in, where Asia Minor is, and the Dore- Doreans in the west. Now, why are the Doreans interesting? Because the Doreans, were known, very well known, very famous for one very important quality, that among them, among them, among their kings, ran the line of Hercules, that Hercules' seed was what made up their royal families. So if you take the story of the sons of God and the daughters of men and the beasts that are created, literally, because there are many beasts that are created, leading to the final beast, the seed of the serpent. And the Lord talks about this in his parable of the wheat and tares, where he says that when, you know, God was sleeping, you know, whatever that means, because he says the gardener was sleeping, someone suggested on a show that I was on that maybe it was the Sabbath, the seventh day, the day of rest, perhaps, that would be the day that Satan would strike on, that that enemy, the devil, came and planted his seeds. The God planted his seeds in the garden, but then the enemy came and planted his seeds in the garden. And that the wheat and tares, born of these two seeds, the seed of God and the seed of Satan, these two things, we are told, grow together until the end of the age, until the second coming. So this tells us that this connection between the bloodline of the sons of God and Satan himself um, and us, and we are also the sons of God, because Adam was the son of God. We're told in the genealogy of Christ, it says that he was the son of Adam, the son of God. And we know from the book of Genesis that Adam was made in the image of God. And that is why we are in this you know, crazy story that's so huge and cosmic. And we know that the Lord, when he was challenged by the Pharisees for you know, proclaiming deity, how, do you, how de- dare you declare that you are God? Because we are not like the Greeks. We're not like the Romans. We don't have many gods. We only have one God, and he's in heaven. How do you, how dare you declare to make yourself an idol? I mean, that's what you know, some, some people among the Jews to this day say, that Christians are idol worshipers because they have made a God into a man, and a man into a God. But his response was, he quoted from uh, Psalm 82, and he said, but the scriptures call you by the name of God, Elohim. They call you gods, and they call you guys the sons of the Most High, the sons of El Elyon. If the scriptures call you who received them gods and God, then why can't I you know, say that I am God since I came from God? And, and it implied that, you know, that God had come to the earth. That would have been clear in the dialogue between them in the, in the Jewish thinking, because there was only God in heaven. And so if someone came out of heaven to earth, it meant God himself had come. That, that, that heaven of heavens, that center of the creation that this conversation was addressing, it would have been very clear to the Jewish mindset that he was saying that, listen, guys, I, you know, have come from there. I'm not, it's me. It's the same guy you're, your guys are worshiping. 
uh, yeah, I'm not an idol. I am that guy. I've come. Hello. And so this idea that we are the sons of God and these fallen angels are called the sons of God, and that's why we can procreate together, and that this procreation, this connection of them and us, is so important that it deserved an entire parable called the parable of the wheat and tares. Once you take this literally, that these seeds, the God's seed and certain the devil's seed and, and the seed of the woman and the seed of, of the serpent, and once you take these references in the Bible literally, and why would you take them literally, where in my research, it was the alien abduction phenomenon. I know some people are listening might be just going, what? What did you just say? Alien abduction phenomenon. Well, you got to watch my documentary, UFOs, Angels, and Gods, for it to make biblical sense, because we have Chuck Missler, one who's passed away recently, but he was a great Bible scholar explaining it in detail, so you can hear it from him. The connection between the modern-day abduction phenomenon and the ancient stories of, of, of what we're talking about, the, the Nephilim. This is, this is something that has existed throughout our history, the fallen angels and humans mixing their seed. And that's, there's a parable about it, and it, we're seeing it today documented, and it has been documented in the ancient past. But Satan has hidden this from us. In the ancient past, it wasn't so hidden. Uh, people, you know, the Doreans, they have a her, her, you know, her, Heraclid line of kings among them. Okay, the most important, the second, you know, there are two tribes that are important, and one of them is the son, son of Japheth. The other has, has in, been infiltrated, and then there, all of these cities begin to emerge that have Nephilim founders, and then the most ancient of the cities, the most where archaeologists tell us the realm of the Prince of Greece truly began, the, the, the foundation of Western civilization is Crete where King Minos, the son of Zeus in Europa. And, and so the first Europe is born in the Aegean Sea, where, this, where, where kind of the realm of the Prince of Greece is thrown, his, his, his bloodline, his authority, and the fact that all these humans are in bondage to him. There's a spiritual connection between the sons of Noah and the Prince of Greece. In this small area of the Aegean, where on one side you have Turkey, on the other side you have Greece, and on the south of you have Crete, and the north of you have Thrace, which was which was where Europe which was called Europe. This little tiny area of the world becomes the first micro seed of what will become the West. What will become, you know, the realm of the, of, of the Prince of Greece? What will be, will have his uh, eagles and his bull? You say where is his bull? Well, look on the European a coin. You know, when European Union was formed, and eventually a single currency was created called the euro. Well, um, you know, we already had this knowledge of Zeus and Satan and the bull at that time. So when the year was created and, you know, we, we saw that on, on the European Union's currency and symbol, there was, you know, the symbol of, of the white bull lifting Europe out of the sea. You know, this is on the, on the money of your, on the euro, the euro, that there is the bull lifting Europe out of the sea. So once you understand that this is a satanic symbol... And you see, well, the eagles of the West and the bull of the West, they're all there. And there's a reason why you don't see these symbols. And, and then another one of the symbols, you know, the bull, you remember what the bull has is a horn, right? The symbol of the horn of the bull. Well, that's another one of you know, the symbols of Zeus. He likes the bull as a whole. He likes, he likes, and that's why there was a bull inside of uh, the altar Antipas that the Lord refers to in his letter to the church of Pergamum. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, where the Lord talks about his faithful witness, Antipas, who was killed inside of a brazen bull. Why? Because that was one of the symbols of Zeus and the altar of Zeus, you see. So you see the bull, you see, you see the eagles, and then you see the horn. And where do you see the horn? Well, people call it the crescent of the moon. But is it the crescent of the moon? Or is it the horn of the bull? Depends, I guess, how you kind of, you know, you know, you also see the queen of heaven standing in this horn-like thing. So it, it's, it's, it's interesting that this territory that begins, and so it kind of, you know, it kind of grows and grows, and you've got um, uh, finally under the leadership of Zeus, and, and I really don't want to get into the internal politics um, uh, of the Persian and Greek world and how, uh, you know, even some Persian kings were supporting some Greek ones. And I don't want to get into the politics of it, but let's say that after Alexander, who was a Nephilim king, who was the founder of the realm of the Prince of Greece, 
um, the first king uh, uh, of the imperial age. You know, when, at the time of the ancient history of Greece, where these Nephilims ruled the, that area of the world with Minos and these other guys, and then the humans, humans traveled there and they fell under bondage. And these cities were created, but it wasn't under until the fourth century before Christ, until the three hundreds before Christ, where Alexander, the son of Zeus, rose in order to, uh, you know, bring declare the imperial scepter had now moved, you know, from Egypt to Assyria to Babylon to Persia, and now finally, the realm of the Prince of Greece was about to, you know, be inaugurated. And it was inaugurated by Alexander, and it continues, you know, to to rule the world, and to be the most important part of the world, uh, and and has had many different capitals. And today, I have to say that one of its most important capitals is the District of Columbia. So the um, um, the this whole thing with um, what was I saying? The bull and the eagles um, uh, when um, the empire begins under Alexander. Um, he dies. And when he dies, four generals uh, inherit his kingdom. And that is recorded in great detail in the book of Daniel. I mean, it's incredible. People have said, though, the book of Daniel must have been written before, after the fact, because how could Daniel prophesy so, so clearly about these things? So the empire divides into four, and the guy who inherits um, the part of the Greek empire that the Holy Land, you know, that Israel, that that land you know, God divided the nations and set their boundaries, but then he told Abraham, I'm going to take you to a land that I will be the God of it, and this will be the boundaries of it. And you can Google ancient Mesopotamian boundary stones so you can understand this concept of boundaries and how it was related to the gods. Uh, so when the Greeks um, the, have their empire divided into four after Alexander's death, one of the guys who, who comes to power is Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus Epiphanes, who, whose name literally means God manifest, but once you do a little bit of digging, because sometimes people who translate these things for us, it actually means Zeus manifest. He was a very, very devout follower of Zeus. And, um, and he came to power, how? Because he was funded and supported by the king of Pergamum, because for intrigues that I don't have time to get into, it had to do with, with the rise of kind of what was left of the ancient Persian power. And, and so Pergamon was, you know, supporting, you know, it was on the border of, of, of the Prince of Persia's land and the Prince of Greece's land. So it was kind of supporting, you know, the Greek power. And so per, the king of Pergamon, who built that altar to Zeus and was also himself a devout follower of Zeus, he, the guy who built that altar, he then funds Antiochus Epiphanes and helps him take control. And when Antiochus Epiphanes becomes the leader, he then, you know, enters the Holy Land, which is under his control. He was one of the generals of Alexander. He enters the Holy Land and he says, you know what? No more sacrificing to this God of Israel's. No more. And then he goes one step further. He abolishes the sacrifices. He goes, well, two steps further. He then goes into the a mercy seat, you know, the seat that represents the altar where, where, where Christ w- was sacrificed, and that's the mercy seat symbolizes the sacrifice, uh, the altar of Christ's sacrifice, and it is also the seat we are told that he will rule from when he returns to the earth, and he will have a temple in the city of Jerusalem. He will sit on the mercy seat, and it will become his actual throne. So that on that altar, he sacrifices a pig, and if you Look at what God says about, you know, that, that the pigs are an abomination. You know, I know even secular Jews who don't eat pork, like pigs. He, he sacrifices a pig on the altar, and then in, he goes into the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was supposed to be sealed only on the Day of Atonement. You know, the high priest could go in, and it was a symbol, of course, of the Lord going into the heavenlies, in the presence of God. And... Inside of the Holy of Holies, the presence of God would descend over the priest on the Day of Atonement. And so this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, Zeus Manifest, he goes into the Holy of Holies, and there he erects an altar to Zeus in the Holy of Holies. And this begins the fulfillment of a prophecy that Daniel had uttered several centuries before in the time of the realm, in the time of the Prince of Persia. He had Daniel had uttered this prophecy in the book of Daniel that this 
that the that the temple would become desolate for three and a half years. That would become desolate for three and a half years, and that's the beginning of the desolation. The temple can no longer be used now. Now that it has had the pig sacrificed on it and had this altar in it, it's no longer usable, it's no longer holy, and sacrifice ceases for three and a half years until one of the priests... So I have to tell you that this was a very dark time in Israel's history. It was... this. Many of the priests of Israel were Hellenized. Many of the priests of Israel agreed with Antiochus Epiphanes. They, they said, okay, we won't sacrifice anymore. And they were wearing togas, and they had become very Greek, and they spoke Greek to each other, and it was a Hellenized. And that's why even you know the Greek Bible that we were talking about at the beginning was used, because a lot of the, the Jews who lived in the Greek world no longer spoke Hebrew. And if you wanted to share the word of God with them, you had to do it in Greek. And, and so um, it was a dark time in Israel's history, and it was not a people that did not know God. It was a people that had gone away from God. And it was here that this uh, Satan decided this is a good time for me to just abolish uh, you know, this, this contact point between man and God, this temple. Because when you look at the Old Testament and you say to yourself in the books of Moses, what, are, what is the one thing in the book of Moses that has the most amount of verses dedicated to it? If you numerically counted all the verses in the first five books of Moses, there are more verses about the tent of meeting, about the temple, the meeting place, Mishkan, than any other thing. Because God's most important thing is that he wants to meet with us. And we meet with him in, you know, in Christ, which is the temple of God, where we meet the Father. And so this is the meeting place. And, and if you said, just as a side note, by the way, if you said, well, in the verses dedicated to this meeting place in the Old Testament books of Moses, what is the most thing talked about in those verses specifically? Well, it's the menorah, the candlestick, because the light of God, that's what, that's what the candlestick represents, the light of God. And so the light of God shining in the world. So what is abolished here is this contact point between man and God and the light of God is extinguished. Now there is all of these other lands under the control of the sons of God, under the control of Zeus, the founder of the post diluvian world and great realm of the prince of Greece. And this servant of his, he now comes into the only place where God is worshipped, this temple, where the, his priests are, his scriptures are. Many, many of the prophets were priests, like Isaiah. Um, and, and, and what does he do? He then abolishes that and makes a desolate, fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel that the desolation, the temple would be desolate for three and a half years. And so here we see, you know, Zeus striking and the story, the plot thickens. Um, so what happens is that this particular house of Levi's, uh, the Maccabees, they're called, they are indignant when they see this and they say enough is enough. And they rise, and they, this ragtag team of hillbillies, basically, is able to push the great Greek uh, armies, the phalanx, this Alexander, you know, his generals, now he's dead, but his general Antiochus Epiphanes, these guys push them out. And they rededicate the temple, and, and, and in Hebrew, the re rededication of the temple is called Hanukkah, or as they like sometimes say, Hanukkah. So Hanukkah, and it's interesting because Hanukkah in the whole of the Bible, because it was not one of the original feasts of Moses, it was celebrated now, the rededication of the temple, is only mentioned once in the whole Bible, and it's mentioned in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, the fisherman from Galilee, Johannan. In his Gospel, um, in chapter 10, uh, I think it's verse 22 around there, uh, you people can look it up, but it's definitely in chapter 10 of the Gospel of John, Hanukkah is mentioned. It's the only place in the whole Bible it's mentioned. And the Lord, you know, talks about it. And he says, you know, because they would take these giant candlesticks, like 20 feet, 30 feet high, and they would put them around the gates and walls of Jerusalem. So when you were, because Jerusalem is a sea on hill, and you could see these giant lights, you know, shining out of Jerusalem, the light of God had been reestablished, because that's what the candlestick represented. And the Holy Spirit, you know, that is inside of us, we are the light of God, as the, as, you know, as God shines his light in us, and he ignites our spirit with the presence of his own spirit. We then become like the candlesticks. And the candlestick, you know, uh, uh, had... Uh, 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 of Hanukkah, 
uh, that is that is used there er, er, had you know um, this one candle that was taller than the other ones, and that is the one you use because every day you light a different candle. There's eight of them, and so, uh, the Hanukkah candle that has eight, and so there's this one candlestick that is used to light the other ones, and this is Christ who lights us all. And so the Lord pointed to this light, and he that is where he made his great speech, that he was the light of the world. You know, he chose Hanukkah. And so Antiochus Epiphanes, what he had extinguished was ultimately this light. And then the Lord reestablished it, and the temple was reestablished. But then the realm of the Prince of Greece evolved from the time of Greece to Rome. Rome rose, and they called him, they called Zeus Jupiter, but they continued to sacrifice to him in his throne in Pergamum. And when Rome rose, and Satan, you know, that's what the Hebrews called him, they didn't call him Jupiter. When Satan came and he offered the throne to the Messiah, and the Lord said, No way, I'm not taking it, thank you. Um, he went into plan B. And plan B was his undoing, he didn't know it. Plan B was, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you so that you can't become the king, you can't become the Messiah, and I will then continue to put my own beasts, um, these hybrids, that's what the beasts are, these hybrids of, uh, you know, the seed of serpent, the seed of man. I'm going to put my own on the thrones of my own empires with my eagles and my bulls and my horns and my laws and my altars, and, and, and I'll continue to hold the, the, man, the race of man in bondage because man has been cast out of heaven the way I have been cast out of heaven. And, and we are now you know, together in this world, and I'll continue to, to hybridize the entire world, and I'll have my ruling hybrids in the top, you know, like starting with King Minos and these, you know, the great Nephilims that are the foundation of the realm of the Prince of Greece or the West. I'll continue this. I'm going to murder you, and I'm going to destroy the temple. And distinguish the light, and that's what he does, fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel that that the Messiah would be killed on the 69th week, and then the temple destroyed by the Prince of Rome. You know, the, the, by the same. So Rome comes under Jupiter, and, and once again Zeus rises against the temple, but this time he also rises against the Messiah, who is the light of the world, not just the presence of God descending in the temple as the light of the world, but God Himself. And this, of course, is his undoing because every time he strikes something, you know, the opposite happens. You know, he tries to 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 to, to extinguish the light at the time of Antiochus, but then, you know, bang, the light reemerges. He decides to extinguish it by killing the Messiah and destroying the temple. What does God do in response? He brings the Messiah back to life, unleashes the Holy Spirit to the nations, and declares that all the families of the earth who are cast out of the Tower of Babel can now return to fellowship with the living God, not just the Jews. Everyone is called back. And so this becomes the second response to God, from God, to Satan's attack through these empires that he creates, uh, whether it's Zeus or Jupiter, the prince of Greece, attacks a second time. But this is not the end of our tale, because the Lord surprises us all when the disciples say to him, Tell us about the signs of the your at the end of the end of the age. In Matthew chapter twenty four, the Lord says, "When you see the abomination of desolation, which was you know the altar of Zeus had made desolate, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, then leave Jerusalem." So suddenly, this prophecy that Daniel had spoken, which everyone at this point believed had been fulfilled. During the time of Hanukkah, for three and a half years, the temple had been desolate. The Lord reaches into the scriptures, resurrects this story, and says, Nay, this was not fully fulfilled. This is a type of a future event that is going to occur. And so, one more time, one more time, the eagles and the bulls and the realm of the prince of Greece, one more time, all the nations are destined to gather against Jerusalem and against her king. But this time, when they try to you know, make the temple desolate, place their own antichrist, stop the oblation and sacrifices once again, and put their own guy in charge in the temple and ask him to be worshipped as God and declare this him as, uh, as the, uh, you know, the one who receives the power from the dragon and all his throne and authority, and declare him above all that is called God. God. When that happens, 
the third time, the third attack of the realm of the Prince of Peace against Jerusalem, when that occurs, once again, it unleashes a blessing. This time, it will bring the Messiah, the King, not the Lion of Judah, not just the Lamb of God, and with him, his angels and his chariots and, and a new age and the end of these empires. And so the three times that, that the Prince of Greece attacks, the three times it actually unleashes something good. So this is kind of where we're headed. And when you get the symbology and with the fact that the throne now sits in Germany, in Berlin, and why Germany? Well, when you look at kind of this world uh, of Christ, of the ancient world, which begins with Asia Minor in Greece, where the throne was and, and where the Prince of Greece started. Once this thing begins, but the Lord goes to heaven, he receives the scepter of power. He writes a letter to Pergamum and says, you know what? Your throne, no longer my throne, is now the throne, and it's the one in heaven. And you know, God says to him, sit here at my right hand until I put your enemies under you as a footstool under you and then when the father decides the time is right he will send the son and the son will establish reestablish the fallen tabernacle of king david this is what the script promises us fulfilling isaiah's prophecies you know that he will be the son uh, of god and he will be um uh, you know the prince of peace and he will be uh, the uh, the the one who on whose shoulders the government will sit and he will be one of David's offsprings, bringing those two things together at his return. So when he writes that letter to Pergamum and to these seven churches, which was the beginning of the genesis of where the soul of man was, bond, was, was, was bonded with the Prince of Greece. And he says, no, I'm freeing people from you. And so the citizens of your realm no longer were sacrificed to you. They will worship me and they will accept the sacrifice I offered on Calvary in the city of Jerusalem outside of the temple you know, where Abraham sacrificed not Isaac nearly, you know, where um, Solomon built a temple on that mountain where all these sacrifices were offered on the appointed day of the Passover. You know, by the way, when John the Baptist, you look at John the Baptist, and he's a very interesting character because his dad is a priest, but his mom is also from a priestly family. John the Baptist is like, is like a super priest. And we are told that he's the greatest, you know, culmination of, of the Old Testament prophets. And when you look at the Passover lamb, well, you had to bring it to a priest. And he had to look at the lamb and, and declare this was good and right according to the law of God that this lamb could be the Passover lamb of your family. And that is why when he, as a priest, when he sees the Messiah coming, he says, this is the lamb of God because he's doing his priestly duty. He is pointing to the proper lamb, you know, God, the Holy Spirit chooses uh, this priest, John the Baptist, to fulfill that requirement of the priest declaring the lamb sufficient for sacrifice. That's why he says, behold, the lamb of God. In some ways, you know, it begins the process. The rest of the three years of his ministry is the process of that lamb being prepared. And, you know, eventually he's tortured. You know, that, can you imagine killing a lamb? Like, you know, it, it goes through some preparation and, and his abductors do that to him. And then they put him on a cross. And what is a cross? What is a cross? Well, a cross is a piece of wood. And I was listening to this, you know, a Jewish uh, uh, Christian teacher uh, explain this. It was very powerful. He said that uh, you look at the uh, the blood that was put, it was, I think, Jonathan Kahn. He was saying that when you look at the blood that was put on the doors um, of, of, of Egypt, well, that was a piece of wood, and you put a blood on top and a blood on either side, and it was pointing upwards like an arrow. And then God took another piece of wood, and then he put another lamb, another blood on it, you know, because the blood of the lamb was put on the doors of Egypt, and the blood of the lamb was put on another piece of wood on both sides of it, but but this time not on its head, but it's on its foot like an arrow pointing down. And and so so suddenly the cross, he was saying, is not just a atonement instrument, but when you connect it to the doorposts of Egypt, it is the gateway to the resurrected life. You know, out of the bondage, you know, from the gods of Egypt. So so we are being freed, not just from some spiritual realm or bondage or whatever. It's not just a religion that we here in the colonies have heard from our Protestant forefathers. This is the story of Adam and what befell him after he left the garden and how we were put into the hands of the fallen angels 
and rescued by the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of David. And how the Holy Spirit poured into these realms and began to push back the strength of the bondage of these guys. And so that was the response of God to the destruction of the temple, to the murdering of the Messiah. And so as this thing began to, to be freed, the Greco-Roman world continued for a while, but then eventually the, the Western part of the Roman world fell. It fell to who? To the Germanic tribes. And they then gradually grew, and one of the tribes, you know, the Franks, they formed the Holy Roman Empire of Charlemagne. And in this way, Rome continued, and its eagle continued, and even its name continued, the Holy Roman Empire. And even the Catholic Church is a continuation of Rome. Very clearly, the Pope still wears, you know, the clothing and the carry title of the priest of Zeus, of Jupiter, the Pontifus Maximus. Even the clothing that the Pope wears is the clothing of the priest of Jupiter, of the Pontifus Maximus. And these houses of, of, you know, what happens to, to those who worship these guys, these gods in the West, as it grows, you know, from Rome westward, what happens to, to those who continue to worship in their hearts and minds and openly even to these, these fallen angels? They go underground. They're forced to go underground and they form the secret societies. And these secret societies continue with their agenda and we see for instance in cities like washington which was chosen by the secret societies as one of the very important capitals um we see you know all the masonic lodges and we see all the universities that have you know these secret societies and we see that the guys who graduate from them become senators and congressmen and presidents in the case of let's say you know george bush who was you know part of the secret society in princeton the skulls and bones and kelly you know the secretary of state under obama he was also a graduate of that uh, yale and he also belonged to the skull and bones which only has seven members um and we see uh, that these guys become influential and we see it on the american dollar bill with the announcement that the new secular order novus ordo secularum will be the 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 paradigm that will govern the minds of the sons of the republic will be secularism which is a religion decreed by the fallen angels like other religions decreed by them but it it, it what, this one what, is very what about the what annex about society? society the annex society yeah the annex society, annex society. I'm going to write that down so I look into it. Because you know that, uh, you know, that Anak ties into it. Enoch. Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, Enoch, like, um, what's his name? Gary Wayne really does a great job of connecting Enoch uh, and, and to, you know, the, the evil Enoch to the beginning of uh, these false religions. Uh, and the hieroglyphs, which are kind of the secret uh, writings, you know. That's what hieroglyph means, secret writing. Well, the, even the Annex Society themselves, they their uh, their uh, symbology or whatever and stuff has to do with the all-seeing eye as well as a a uh, cyclops. Yes, and and if you, for instance, go on the on the website, uh, it's a government website. It's called um, Architect of the Capital. It's it's a government website that will that explains the history of the architecture of the capital building uh it says perhaps the single greatest example of these architectural sites styles is the united states capitol building for which construction began in 1790 in a replica of an ancient roman temple since the capitol in richmond virginia was an example of roman cubic architecture he thought the federal capital should be modeled after a spherical temple so thomas jefferson who himself was part of these secret societies and you look at kind of the 4th of July, the very middle of the year, uh, you know, the day of illumination, and, and the Capitol building is by design, by design, on purpose, declared to be a replica of an ancient Roman temple. But I said, in, in the ancient world, these, these priests of these gods were politicians. And so we see through the school system, through the university system, and, and this, all of these various organizations are created. These guys continue to rule the West and the symbols of the eagle. But it is, in a way, out of Germany that the second Europe is born. It becomes kind of the first power, the Holy Roman Empire. And then, you know, we see Napoleon tries, who is a type of this guy, uh, of the Antichrist. You know, he tries to do it. And, and then the British rise. And then of all the colonies, you know, the American colony ends up being the one that ends up being the most powerful of all the colonies. 
Um, and so uh, it declares itself a republic and, um, and separates from the crown of England, but continues you know, to rule. And if you look at the census records, I mean, not that it matters, but most Americans uh, are descendants of, of the English and the Germans. These are the two main bloodlines that form uh, the American population. Um, not that matters because these eagles, you know, even the Moscow has it. So from, from Moscow, where the Caesar or Tsar rules, all the way into the houses of Europe, and into, uh, where, where the bull, the symbol of the bull is, and the symbol of the eagles, and this architecture, and these secret societies. And so the religion goes underground, but continues, the worship of, of Satan continues to exist. And these houses continue to be dominant houses of rule. And the realm of the Prince of Greece continues to to grow and exist and yes it it, it attacks under zeus you know the temple um uh, with antiochus epiphanes and the story of hanukkah and yes rome you know under jupiter uh, this, uh, kills the messiah and establishes and destroys the temple but one more time and 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 if god has recalled jerusalem back and and, and of course you know, um, when when the president of the United States declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel, that was a very important declaration because it occurred in 2017, which is exactly 50 years after 1967, when Jerusalem was repatriated um, to the Jewish uh, people after uh, the Romans took them in 70 AD. Um, you know, in 1967, it was returned. They re they got it back. And 50 years after 1967 is the year, you know, it says in the Bible that every 50 years is the year of Jubilee and where all the inheritance of people is returned to them, all their lost inheritance is returned to them. And it was then that the lost inheritance was returned because the president of the most important country declared this the Jewish capital. And so this, uh, the fact that God, you know, the Rome scattered uh, Israel. And what did God do to Rome? It broke it into pieces and scattered it in all these eagles. Now that God has regathered Israel and regathered Jerusalem together, perhaps now we will see Rome unite again to form a single empire. And this will be the final beast empire. And so uh, the, when you look at the book of Revelation, when John wrote it, you know, the worldview he had was that there was one empire under Jupiter with one emperor. And that is what is now can emerge once again. I am now seeing this. You know, people have said, oh, well, will it come from the West? Will it be an Islamic antichrist? This and that. Now I'm seeing it through the realm of principalities, not as not not these just little nations. I now see that everything West of, of Istanbul, including Moscow and all of Europe and the colonies, this is all the realm of the Prince of Greece. And that's why it has the symbol of the eagle and the bull. And that's why the main power of the world is among these cities and these the, in these countries. And that's why the greatest armies are there, the greatest money is there, the greatest political power is there, and the greatest um, um, technology and science is there. Because this is the part of the world that Satan has reserved as his own personal imperial seat. And that is why his throne is there as well. You know, and and there's a reason he took his throne at the same time that God began to regather the Jews was because he realized the time of the second coming has arrived. And he wanted to stop it. He put his throne there. He chose a guy. He declared a holocaust. And he said, no more, no more, no more of this, you guys going back there. Let's have not the 1,000-year rule of Christ, as spoken in the book of Revelation, but let's have the 1,000 Reich. You know, let's prolong my rule by, by stopping you guys. From going back, and of course, again, that backfired on him. It was the very thing that the Holocaust that gave birth to the Jewish nation and fulfilled prophecy, like it says in Isaiah 66. You know, who has ever heard of this of a, of you know a nation being born in a single day? In 1948, bang. And so this is this is very important. So the architecture of the West, the symbols of the flag, the secret societies, this continues. Now, the realm of the Prince of Persia, which is not something that we should at all you know, forget about. Um, I think I would even say that some of the uh, contention that exists today between America and Iran is in fact the manifestation of these two principalities arguing with each other because I think as the powers are, um, I think that the way they see it is once they kind of have their power defined, 
as Satan carries his revolution into the universe and into the throne room of God, you know, God forbid, of course, but that's their ambition. As they carry this thing through, I think the amount of power they get in the larger structure, in a way, is a is a manifestation of what they have here. Like, it's here that they're duking it out of each other. And then you look at the realm of the Prince of Greece in the West, one of the great agents of the Prince of Greece is the Queen of Heaven, and she doesn't have, you know, political power in that sense. She has ideological power. She's an agent that is to bring false uh, information and offer a different gospel to the to the realm of the Prince of Greece in the West, and specifically to the Church, his people, the people of God, and then you have the Moon God who is then unleashed into the realm of the Prince of Persia, and he kind of, you know, has the same type of uh, function as the Queen of Heaven. He brings this other gospel, this ideological thing. Now he does rise out of Arabia, and they do conquer a piece of land, so there's political power attached to it as well. But I think it is a power that emerges within the land of the Prince of Persia rather than competing with it. Because the, the, the Prince of Persia, even though maybe has its seat in Iran because he's called the Prince of Persia, I, uh, Egypt, Turkey, all these lands are within its territory. And because that's how big the realm of the Prince of Persia was at the time of its glory, where God showed it to us, you know. So if you take the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, and you take all of the empires that are in it from, you know, the head to the toe, you can say that from the toes, from the two legs, which are the realm, rises the ten toes. So you can say that from the realm, the prince of Greece will rise ten kings, ten Nephilim kings. And you see the symbol of the eagles, and you see the bull, and, and it's very clear the West is the main power of the world. Once Russia and the, and the United States and Europe unite, then they'll form, you know, the most powerful beast. You can see it that way, and that's okay with me, and I'm, I would totally say you're biblical. Um, now you can look at it from another point of view, and that is this. If you took the realm of the Prince of Persia, which would be kind of the Persian, uh, North Africa, and Turkey, including you know, uh, well, the Holy Land, I guess, is right in the middle of it, but that belongs to God and is under the control of Michael and the protection of Michael. Um, once you take the realm of the Prince of Persia and you take the realm of the Prince of Greece and you combine them together, you say, I'm going to, let's say the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece sign on the dotted line with each other. They make a deal with each other. Suddenly you have an empire where the Sunni world, where the Arab nations, the Sunni world and Iran are brought into the fold and you have the West and Russia brought into the fold and they form now an empire. This would be the two realms, the realm of the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece combined. And it would be like taking the entire statue of the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar and turning it into a single empire. Because those two statues, the head and, and the chest, uh, Babylon and Medo-Persia, fall within the realm of the Prince of Persia. And the lower part of the body, Greece and Rome, fall within the realm of the Prince of Greece. So the, the, the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar is specifically a dream of four empires that rise out of the two realms of these two princes, you see, of the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece. So that's another point of view where these ten kings, five of them come from the Prince of Greece's land, five come from the Persia's land, and they together form, you know, the great empire. And of course, India and China would then be the kings of the east. And they would, of course, say, who can possibly make war with this great beast? Another perspective, we'll have to see which way it goes. But by looking at it through the territories of principalities rather than nation states and appreciating the longevity of these principalities over the centuries and how they can carry out their plans with patience and gradually and how they always have these you know, antichrists or beasts ready to rise and take over, you know, it gives us a different way of looking at things rather than just looking at it through the concept of nation states and the West and the Muslim world and Rome and this and that and empires, but pull back. It's like zooming out one more zoom and seeing it from the point of view of principality territories and rethinking biblical prophecy and biblical history from this point of view. It's kind of where my mind is now going with this revelation. And so it's a different way of understanding things. Um, but it makes a lot of sense. So to summarize, 
um, the 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 Western world begins exactly where the realm of the Prince of Persia ended in Asia Minor, where the seven churches existed. And where the seven churches existed was actually um, the the where the tribe of Javan, where the Prince of Greece gets its name from. That is where the altar of Zeus was placed, whom the Lord refers to as the throne of Satan. That is where, the, in the Aegean Sea, that is the birth of the West, the prince of Greece's realm. And Crete, the island of Crete, is where it all is the oldest place. From here, it grows to become under Alexander, the Greek world, and attacks the temple of God and gets defeated. Then it becomes the Roman world. And then attacks the Messiah and the Temple of God, and yet God then frees his, all the nations and sends his Holy Spirit and, and writes a letter to the throne room of Satan in Pergamum and says, no, guys, I now have the scepter. The f- people are now freed. Satan continues to expand his empire ever westward, you know, starting with the fall of Rome in the West. He, you know, Rome doesn't fall. It pollinates, you know, Germany and Spain and France and Portugal and England and and then these guys, you know, can become the new Rome all the way from Moscow to, to London. And then they colonize and seed the colonies with their seed and with their sectors of rule. The, the, the Spanish and the Portuguese extend their power into the south. The French and the English extend their power into the north. And then the Sikh societies declare that they have chosen Washington, D.C. to become their capital. And they carve it out. To carve that particular colony out of the European sphere of influence and create an independent federal reserve and uh, uh, political presidency in, uh, out of it that they can now have a lot of control over. Um, and they then uh, begin to build that power over the course of time. And now where we are in the, in the story is that you know God brings the Jews back to the land, r- declares Jerusalem their capital, Satan tries to stop it through the Holocaust, but and his altars, you know, inspires Hitler's guy inspires um, uh, architect is inspired by the altar of Zeus. Do you know who else was inspired by the altar of Zeus? President Obama went to Germany to do a speech, and he went to the same museum like the architect of Hitler, and he saw the altar, and he was inspired, and he said to his people, "When I do my inauguration speech, I want to do it from a replica of the altar of Zeus." And if you Google that, you'll see it. His 2009 inauguration speech, he did it from from a replica of the altar of Zeus. People could argue that that the President Obama, um, you know try to push back the Judeo-Christian heritage of the United States, you know, put the rainbow flag on the White House uh, and, and, and try to re- rewrite the laws of gender and sexuality. And, and he said that he had never heard the voice that spoke to Abraham as a senator when he was making that speech, I saw. And so, so, so you could argue that, you know, despite some of the good things he, he may have done as well, and he supported Israel militarily, but he also signed a deal with Iran. He did a lot of things. That, that one could say, you know, perhaps was the spirit that moved through him, you know, um, was maybe in harmony with the altar that inspired his inaugurational setting. So this whole this whole story involves also the bloodline of the sons of God, which which the ancient cities uh, uh, of, of the Aegean Sea where Europe was born had Nephilim kings. And these guys continue to have to be inside the houses of power like Alexander the Great. And they continue to be in the houses of power in in, in the royal families of, of Europe and, and, and even into the United States. And their ideologies continue to shape the thinking of people. But God's Holy Spirit now is here and his word is declared and no one has been able to destroy his Bible uh, or silence his gospel. And, and his word continues to, you know, march on um, and, uh, you know, until the time where God uh, releases the vats uh, where his grips of wrath are stored. <laughs> and so he, he, it's marching on his gospel through into China uh, and, and, and everywhere. Uh, I mean, it reached China before it reached the English anyways through the Silk Road. But regardless, it's not come back into the realm of, of, of moon God as well as the Muslim world is awakening. You know, in Iran, of course, is leading this awakening with their, there's Christians there everywhere now. Um, I was just talking to this Afghani pastor in uh, just on Friday night, and he was he is an Afghani pastor who used to be part of the Taliban, and then God saved him, and then he became a pastor, 
and in you know he's from the Pashtun tribe, and they in in anyways, he, he's from a tribe where they speak Persian. So I was able to speak to him in Persian, and then he was telling me that he goes to this Iranian church in Toronto where he uh, preaches once a month. And he was said last time he was there, there was twenty eight people that got baptized. And so this is something that we're seeing that no one can stop them marching forward, but of the Holy Spirit and of the gospel and of the salvation that has come to the families of the earth and the blessing that is found in the seed of Abraham. And and we who, like Abraham, have the faith in the God of Abraham, we inherit the inheritance that God uh, you know, promised the sons of Abraham. And so um, Satan's empire, its eagles and its bulls, and uh, you know, continues to rule in the West, and its capital buildings and that are looked like temples, and its secret societies that educate, uh, you know, the leaders of the nations the way that that the priests of were involved in politics, and the false religions that are poured out into these realms uh, by other principalities that work under their command, and so this is kind of the big the big picture uh, of the bloodlines of the principalities of powers. And so these are the two realms, the Prince of Persia and Greece. And I see the Beast Empire being orc and entirely coming out of the realm of the Prince of Greece with um, basically Moscow and D.C. and everything in between uniting to form the largest you know, industrial power of the world. Or I see the two realms, the Prince of Greece and the Prince of Persia, uniting um, and in order to form this final empire. Uh, so if those two guys, those two principalities of Satan and his second guy in command – the prince of Greece is Satan, and the prince of Persia is the second guy in command in his kingdom. If these two guys sign together on the dotted line, then we'll have ourselves an empire. Uh, but, but we are told that this empire and this final beast can't rise until the one that hinders is removed, is taken out of the way. That's what it says in Paul's writing. It says that you know the one that hinders uh, is taken out of the way. And that's very important to understand. It doesn't say it's taken out, but it's taken out of the way. So when it's taken out of the way, uh, then the sky can rise. So who is it that is taken out of the way? Some will say it's the Holy Spirit, and I'll never argue with that. And I'll say, yes, indeed, that could be very possible. But what if, what if, just since we're allowed to think, what if the one that's holding back is Michael? The Michael, the third guy in the story of Daniel, the one who protects Israel. What if God says to Michael, the time of the judgment has come. I want to gather these guys, these Nephilim armies and their, you know, and their fallen angel leaders. I want to gather them into the Valley of Judgment, as the prophet Joel tells us, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The, and the book of Revelation gives us the location. It's Armageddon, north of Jerusalem, which is a big empty valley, the Valley of Jezreel. God says, okay, it's the time has come, Michael. I want you to stand down. Allow Israel Allow these guys to attack. Allow these guys to rise. And so the story of these three princes then comes full circle. Michael stands down and the prince of Greece and the prince of Persia unite and attack. And this prompts the second coming, which is uh, prophesied as old as Enoch. So this is just a possibility. Uh, but these understanding of these princes, so why is it that scripture points to these be princes because they have very important roles. Uh, the prince of Greece is Satan, and he controls you know everything west of Constantinople, and and where the birthplace of the West was, all the way to the shores of California. That's his domain. Sure, he has dominion over all the other realms because you know he's the big Kahuna, but he has a space and this planet that he likes to consider his backyard. That's where he likes to put his throne room. That's like where he where he likes to put his most important, powerful political leadership. That's where he likes to put his biggest guns and nuclear weapons and lasers and DNA testing and, and all the greatest technology and NASA and all that stuff. And that's where he likes to put his um, greatest wealth and money and economic power and the lords and ladies of, of London and Berlin and D.C. And that's like he likes to put it there, right? You know, so so this is kind of you know, and of course his bloodline that that begins with with the with King Minos and the Nephilim founders of of, of the cities that the Lord writes letters to, all the way into the European bloodlines into the New World. I'm sure these bloodlines are still very important to him. And now we have the hybrid population that has been that you know I documented in my first documentary, but now Goliath Rising is coming together in my consciousness, and um. It is going to really now drive home 
kind of what's happening today with the hybrid integration and that the, a very large portion of the human population is being hybridized. And of course, a lot of the people that are into UFOs are falling in love with this hybrid name and with their fallen angel leaders. And this is preparing the ground for the beast to rise. And I think, yes, they're definitely he, the West will, even if he, even if, even if these two realms unite, even if that's the scenario, the West will be the one that will be leading it. The West, the realm of the Prince of Greece, that definitely is where the Antichrist will come from because that's where the throne of Satan sits. And that's because the two other times where the temple were, was attacked and the Messiah and God were attacked, they both were on the man of Zeus and Jupiter and the Prince of Greece. Of course, the third one will be the same because the Lord said, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the Holy of Holies, then leave Jerusalem. So we know that, that it's the Prince of Greece that continuously is pointed to by God, including in, in the letter to Pergam, and that is the realm of the West. So it definitely is from there that the Antichrist will rise. For sure. So I agree now with the old Protestant thought that it is from the Roman side that, that he will rise. I agree now. I see that that's correct. That are really, um, you know, you could say the fifth empire is a fifth empire, the extension of the feet. And we, but definitely it's, it, Rome never really died. That's true. And that's why, like I was just reading right here, right? It's right in front of me. Thomas Jefferson wanted Congress house a replica of an ancient Roman temple. Um, the U.S. Capitol's designs derived from ancient Greece and Rome evoke the ideals that guided the nation's founders as they framed their new republic. This is this is the government website. In the 1850s, architect Thomas Walter added to the original design with main, while maintaining the neoclassical style. His additions included the north and south extensions and the cast iron dome. Another well-known example of the neoclassical architectural style in Capitol Hill is the U.S. Supreme Court building uh, uh, finished and occupied in 1935, the Supreme Court is meant to resemble a great marble temple. The architect of the Supreme Court, Cass Gilbert of New York City, drew upon the classical Roman temple form as the basis of the court's new building. So you have the architecture of the temples, you have the laws of Rome, you have the Senate, of course, you know, which was Rome, and you have the civil law of Rome. I don't know if people know, but the civil Roman law is the basis of most of the law of the world today. He said, okay, we're, no, we're the law of the Jews. Okay, that comes from the old the law of Moses. You know, there's the canon law of the Catholic Church, okay? And there's the Sharia law of Islam. If you took kind of a bird's eye view, the majority of the legal systems of the world, if you numerically counted them, and I've seen maps of this, by far, the most of the world's law comes from Roman civil law. So... This is, you know, very interesting, the influence. And, of course, the altar, the throne, now sits in Berlin. And we know that the Holocaust, what that all was about. And now we're going to see the new, you know, the beast will, will make another run. So we'll see if the third temple rises in Jerusalem and we get closer and closer to the second coming. And God then tells the hinderer, he removes the hinderer out of the way, whatever it may be. Whether it's the Holy Spirit or Michael, these are the two candidates for me right now. These guys will then rise again, and Rome will unite again, and they will have a leader again. And, that, and then all the eagles and the bull will unite. That would mean that Moscow, all of Europe, and the Americas would have to unite, at least North America. And that would be enough to form what, an empire. Now, if that empire also unites with the realm of the Prince of Persia, then you truly have all the nations will gather against Jerusalem. And I guess that must include, you know, America. And that's why Israel has really no one left behind. So then that's when they turn to God and they're like, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then boom, the father says to the son, go. And so the valley of Armageddon. It's, so this is kind of how I see things now in this new perspective. I think I've covered everything I wanted to say. So that's it. The three lights. That God releases the Hanukkah, then the Holy Spirit, and finally the salvation of the world, and finally the second coming. And when the, the, when the third time the attack comes against Jerusalem under the, under the Prince of Greece, it unleashes the second coming and a new kingdom. We are heading into a very unprecedented, exciting time. And we need to all be prepared. Yes. Absolutely fascinating, Ali. Thank you so much for sharing with us. You're welcome. Chad, did you have any questions? 
No, I didn't have any questions. Okay. Well, Ali, is there anything else that you would like to share with us? Or can you tell everyone how to get a hold of you, how to watch the documentary? Yeah, just go on my website, thinkagainproductions.com, thinkagainproductions.com. You can email me through that. If you're going to go on Facebook, instead of you know befriending me, you can like my page, UFOs, Angels, and Gods. Uh, I put stuff there all the time. Um, you can join my YouTube channel because I'm putting new videos where I'm explaining some of these things in detail. And uh, it's the uh, just go go watch UFOs, Angels, and Gods on the internet and like that channel. And then uh, my last words are, as you said, that this is very important to know that the story of the Bible is a real story. It is a story of us. We are characters in this book ourselves. We are the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. We um, have been inside of this great cosmic tale. And the reason why all these strange things are happening on our planet and there's all these you know, UFOs around and these religions and these power structures and these princes is because of who we are. And the Lord has decided to redeem the race of man and has called us back to his bosom and his love and has reestablished us in the great cosmic assembly as the royal priest that will judge the angels. And so he has really shown us great love and great grace. And we have not fear because all of our hairs are counted. God is aware of the most minute details of our lives. Um, I mean, look at the supercomputers that we have today and how much data they can hold. Imagine God and how much data him and his kingdom can hold. There's no mystery to him. He knows your innermost thoughts. And God, like the parable of the prodigal sons is running to meet you as you turn to him even a little bit and repent and this is the season of repentance you know the day of atonement is in a few days from now and this is the days these are the days that god person chose on a calendar that he created this is not church tradition this is not human tradition so this is the season of repentance and this is a season of turning back to god that's what you know in greek repentance has to do with changing your mind and your perspective and in Hebrew, it has to do with returning to the Father, teshuva. Av means Father, and returning to the Father. So returning to the Father means that you change the way you live. And so this is a time when we do that, God runs to us, like the Father ran to the prodigal son. And he will run to you, change your life, and welcome you now in his kingdom, in his arms, and later into his coming kingdom, into a new body, as he beams us up at the rapture, and he returns in his chariots, and destroys these empires, arrests these princes, and ushers in the Sabbath of history and age of peace. And you want to be a part of that, and you want to have a God part of your life today and now. And so really it's about simply relaxing and accepting light and love, and allowing God to love you, and allowing his light to shine inside of you. So this is something that no one has ever been to extinguish. No one has ever been able to extinguish the love of God and extinguish the light of God. And the word of God has never been silenced. And God's prophecies will come true. So this is really, you know, from every point of view, a wonderful thing, a wonderful choice to make in one's life. So the point of my message of unveiling scriptures and bringing these things to life that are mentioned, you know, in the writings of Moses and the writings of Daniel and the book of Revelation, all these things, is to say this book is real and therefore all of its story is true. Trust it and we can trust the God who spoke it. So... You know, don't have any fear. Turn to to the God of love. Amen. Very well said, Ali. Ali, would you like to say our closing prayer, please? Sure. Lord God, thank you for your word you have left for us, which is a light to this world and a light to our paths. Thank you, Father, for making it possible for us to get together and have this conversation. And thank you for Kay and Chad and for their ministry and for the fact that they give voice to so many teachers. And I hope that this will be a blessing to the listener and that their uh, guests in general will be a blessing to their listeners. Lord, they, they don't necessarily know how they touch people, but their ministry does touch a lot of people. And Lord, I pray for them. And I pray that uh, you open the minds and hearts of those who may listen to this message and, and, and I give you thanks uh, for, for these revelations and for the, the, your word and for your son and for your power and authority and for your love and for all that you've done for us and you, that you do for us in our daily lives as well as in our greater story. Blessed be your name and praise be to you, Lord. I pray these things 
and bring us together again to have other conversations. I pray these things in the name of our royal priest, high priest, of our king, of the Lamb of God, um, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Thank you, Ali. Well, that's going to do it for tonight, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We pray that you have a good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. To the night, I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through.